Greetings, Dr. Beckett. Welcome to the Quantum Leap Podcast. Theorizing that one could time travel within his own lifetime, Dr. Sam Beckett led an elite group of scientists into the desert to develop a top-secret project known as Quantum Leap. Pressured to prove his theories or lose funding, Dr. Beckett prematurely stepped into the project accelerator. He awoke to find himself in the past, suffering from partial amnesia and facing a mirror image that was not his own. Fortunately, contact with his own time was maintained through brainwave transmissions with Al, the project observer, who appeared in the form of a hologram that only Dr. Beckett can see in here. Trapped in the past, Dr. Beckett finds himself leaping from life to life, putting things right that once went wrong and hoping each time that his next leap will be the leap home. You are listening to the Quantum Leap Podcast. This is episode 25. Good night, dear heart. Her name's Hilla. Hilla Danner. I hired her as a desk clerk at the beginning of the season. You know how I feel about dead people? I'm a coroner. Well, no. Actually, you're a mortician. <laughs> Maybe I will sit this one out. Uh, Ziggy doesn't know why you're here and about all he's got on Hilla is she committed suicide by drowning on November 9th, uh, 1957. If Hilla committed suicide, I wouldn't be here. The only thing that makes sense is that I'm here to find out who murdered her. That's why I can't believe she killed herself. Maybe she didn't. As much as I hate to admit it, sometimes Al's right. Hilla was haunting me in a way even I couldn't understand. But I kept thinking about the road she had traveled to get here and all she had lost along the way. To die alone, buried and forgotten with her murderer free, I had to be here to change that. Welcome back to the Quantum Leap Podcast. I'm Albie. And I'm Heather. And today we have a great show. We are talking about Goodnight Dear Heart. And also we have a great interview with Jennifer Runyon. You might remember her from the pilot movie of Quantum Leap Genesis. She played Peg Stratton. My favorite. <laughs> Heather has a girl crush on her, so we'll get to hear from her later in the show. How awesome is that? It was really cool talking to her. She's been my favorite since the first episode. I think I mentioned that to her and she was very flattered. Yay. I have to say about Goodnight, Dear Heart, I really liked this episode. Was it what you expected from the preview? Um, No, this was really a weird episode. <laughs> I liked it a lot more than I thought I was going to because I didn't know where it was going. I think three quarters of the way, I kind of guessed the ending of who done it, but... You weren't quite sure, though, I don't think. Right, Yeah. And I really, really like that because a predictable mystery show is just not that exciting. There's a lot of things going on in this episode, but as far as the mystery, I think it was very well done. I agree. I think every character could have done it. Right. Well, I don't, I really didn't suspect Greg because of his reaction to her on the table unless he was just really that good of an actor. Robert Duncan McNeil is that good of an actor. Well, but I mean Greg, if oh. Greg was that good of an actor. But Mr. Truesdale totally suspected him. And there was even like a cross in my mind that the detective might have helped Mr. Truesdale cover it up. Oh, yeah. When he found out Hilly was pregnant, the look on his face was like, uh oh, I've been caught. Yeah, like it was weird. And then I'm like, well, what if the abortion went wrong and they covered it up? I mean, I... There were so many theories that I had in my head the first time I watched this that I was actually shocked because I didn't see the lover angle. That was a good misdirect, really, because Sam assumed one thing when it was actually something else. When he was like, it wasn't me that she broke it off with. I was like, oh, who would she win? <laughs> what? I was like, damn you pronouns. <laughs> I know, because you can't, you can't know if it's a he or she. With, with pronouns and assumptions, you'd get it all wrong. Very well written episode. I don't think so. It actually won an award. Doesn't surprise me at all. And oh, an Edgar Award. Wow. What is an Edgar Award? 
It says it won an Edgar Award for writer Paul Brown for best episode in a TV series. Wow. Best episode. From what I understand, it's for uh, mystery writing. Oh, cool. Oh, duh. Edgar Allan Poe. A lot of good actors in this episode. Two that stood out right away to me were, of course, Robert Duncan McNeil from Star Trek, The Next Generation and Star Trek Voyager, who played Nick Locarno and also Tom Paris on Voyager. And of course, Marsha Cross from Desperate Housewives, among many other things. She was really good. And the character she played, Stephanie, was a really good actress. Because if you watch those scenes knowing that she's the killer, she doesn't act like she's the killer at all. Yeah, she doesn't have any weird suspicious glances or... Maybe that should have been our clue. The only one that didn't look guilty. Yeah, right. But going into the episode, you think Red Herring has red hair and she's got red hair. Not as red as she does now, but back then it was still reddish. That was to trick us. It worked. And, you know, I know who did it, but while watching the episode again, I was thinking, wow, he could have done it. Ooh, he could have done it. He could have done it. When you watch it back, there's no like, oh, yeah, I see now how she totally fooled. I, there's no like. <laughs> Even when they introduced Maggie, she could have done it. Well, I, I take that back. There was when she tried to take the shoe. That was when she was trying to cover it up. On rewatching it. Right. Watching it, it just seems like what it is on the surface. Right. But then rewatching it, that's a perfect opportunity for her to steal the evidence. Yeah. I think if Stephanie hadn't have talked so much, she wouldn't have got caught because there's a lot of clues that she inadvertently gave Sam investigating it, like the photography, the fact that Hilly wouldn't have scuffs on her shoes. If she didn't show back up, like if she didn't go in, nobody would have known. That's another thing. I was thinking of the end scene where they do this in a lot of murder mysteries and maybe Sherlock Holmes. The type of thing I think about when I see these scenes where everybody gets together. Driving to that meeting, you got to know, okay, I'm the one who did this. Why am I driving there instead of the opposite direction? Yeah. I guess she thought that she was just that good. And if you don't show up, then they're like, oh, well, they did it. Yeah. I would drive the opposite direction. Well, I mean, in the previous timeline, she got away with it, so. If it wasn't for that meddling time traveler. And his hologram. And we will talk later about the comic book too, right? Yeah, there's a sequel to this episode. How exciting. Speaking of Stephanie. Stephania. Well, there are a lot of things to talk about after the episode recap. This is season two, episode 17, Good Night, Dear Heart. Original broadcast date, March 7th, 1990. Written by Paul Brown and directed by Christopher T. Welch. Sam leaps in to find himself seated at a desk with a police sheriff dangling a heart-shaped locket in front of him. Sam opens the locket to find a black and white photograph of a smiling family. The sheriff, Lyle Roundtree, guesses that the youngest girl in the photograph must be her. Sam turns around and gets up in shock as he sees a young woman lying motionless on a table and covered by a sheet. He says the woman is dead, and Lyle quips that Sam should have been a detective instead of a mortician. It's November 9th, 1957, and Sam has leaped into Melvin Spooner, the local mortician and coroner of Riven Rock, Massachusetts. The woman on the table is a 19-year-old German girl called Hilla. Lyle tells Sam that Hilla's purse was found at the end of a dock, and one of her shoes was floating in the water below. Sam is horrified to hear that Hilla drowned herself and is visibly uncomfortable at the sight of the young woman's corpse. Lyle comments that maybe the job is starting to get to Sam. Sam and Lyle hear the buzzer of the front door, and Lyle goes out to greet a young man named Greg Truesdale and his father, Roger. Lyle had called Greg with the news of Hilla's death, but Roger insisted on coming along, explaining that Hilla was one of his best employees. Sam offers a handshake to Roger, who looks at Sam's hand and declines with a polite smile. Lyle takes Roger and Greg into the back room to see Hilla. Sam asks Greg, who is distressed at the sight of Hilla's body, if the two of them were close. Greg says they were friends, then leaves without saying anything more. Roger explains that he hired Hilla as a desk clerk at the lodge he owns, and her family was killed during the war. He offers to pay for Hilla's burial, and then leaves with Lyle. Sam finds a passport in Hilla's purse, then quickly puts it away after looking at her picture. He looks at the locket again, and a voice behind him tells him that it belonged to Hilla's mother. The voice belongs to Stephanie Haywood, who starts to cry as she looks at Hilla, She says that she and Hilla were friends, and that she should have stopped her. Stephanie leaves in tears, refusing Sam's request to drive her home. 
Al appears and gets a fright when he finds himself standing in the middle of an open coffin. Sam tells Al that he doesn't need him on the sleep because he arrived too late to save Hilla's life. Al says that according to Ziggy, Hilla committed suicide by drowning. Sam checks Hilla's passport again and realizes that she died on her 19th birthday. He notices a small circular wound on Hilla's left temple and announces to Al that she was murdered. He assumes the wound was made by a bullet, but he can't find an exit wound. He guesses that the bullet never came out and picks up a scalpel, telling Al that the bullet is the only clue they've got. Al quickly leaves when he realizes what Sam is going to do. Later, Sam has extracted a small piece of metal from behind Hilla's ear. Al hesitantly returns to Sam and asks if Sam found the bullet. Sam responds that it's shrapnel from a wound Hilla suffered during the war, and there was no bullet, but he still believes that Hilla was murdered. Al suggests that maybe Hilla shot herself, but Sam counters that if Hilla committed suicide, then he wouldn't be there. Sam visits Greg at Truesdale Lodge. Greg smiles as he greets Sam, but declines to shake his hand. Sam asks which room was Hilla's, explaining that he needs a dress to bury her in. Greg, looking saddened, tells Sam that Hilla's favorite was a blue dress with a bow in the back. Sam asks Greg if he loved Hilla, but Greg walks away without answering. Sam enters Hilla's room and starts playing a record as he looks around at Hilla's belongings. He sees a book of Mark Twain stories and a porcelain doll partially covered in burn marks. Opening Hilla's drawers, he finds a diary and starts reading. In the entries he reads, Hilla writes about needing someone to love, then about meeting Greg and going to the movies with him. In the diary's final entry, on the 4th of July, Hilla writes that she has met someone she could fall in love with and had an argument with somebody else over it, which ended their relationship. As Sam reads the entry, a slip of paper falls out and Sam looks shocked when he reads it. Suddenly, Stephanie walks in and wants to know what Sam is doing there. She turns off the record player and puts Hilla's diary away. She looks at a photo of Hilla that she took and tells Sam she wanted to make a career out of her photography hobby. She and Hilla were going to go to New York together, Hilla as a model and Stephanie as her photographer. Sam tells her that Hilla may have been murdered and asks if she knows who could have done it. Stephanie says that everyone loved Hilla and nobody would have wanted her dead. She then mentions that Roger fired Hilla after she had a fling with Greg. Sam asks her to keep that to herself for now. After Stephanie leaves, Al, who has been listening in, guesses that Sam suspects Roger of murdering Hilla. Sam responds that it could have been Greg, guessing that Hilla's final entry was about breaking up with him. He tells Al that the slip of paper he found is the result of a blood test that proved Hilla was pregnant when she died. Back at the mortuary, Sam and Lyle are arguing over Hilla's death. Sam tries to convince Lyle that Hilla didn't kill herself and that she was shot. Lyle responds that being around the young Hilla's body is having an effect on Sam's thinking. Sam angrily grabs Lyle by the arm as he turns to leave, but Al urges Sam to stay calm. Sam suggests that if Hilla shot herself, then the gun will be at the bottom of the lake, and if Lyle finds it, then he'll drop the subject and agree to bury Hilla. After Lyle leaves, Al tells Sam that even if the gun is found and traced to somebody else, they still haven't found the bullet. Before Sam can respond, a woman named Aggie enters with a makeup kit. Al realizes that Aggie is going to prepare Hilla's face for the funeral and quickly leaves. Aggie asks Sam what dress he's burying Hilla in, and Sam realizes he left the dress in Hilla's room at the lodge. Later, Sam is watching a film on a projector in Hilla's room, taken of a smiling Hilla in a Statue of Liberty costume. Al asks Sam what he's doing there and accuses Sam of becoming obsessed with Hilla. Sam watches an earlier part of the film showing Hilla by a lake, smiling and laughing at the camera, and asks Al if Hilla looks like the kind of girl who could kill herself. Al says that unmarried pregnant girls in the 50s were treated as outcasts, which could have led to Hilla's suicide, but Sam still believes that Greg murdered Hilla after she broke up with him. Al insists that Sam is imagining what he sees in Hilla, but Sam thinks she's trying to tell him something. Al leaves without another word. Sam and Lyle are at the lake where Hilla's body was found, and the gun is nowhere to be seen. Sam insists that someone shot Hilla, but Lyle angrily argues that Sam has no evidence and no motive. Sam tells Lyle that Hilla was pregnant and hints that Greg was the father. Sam and Lyle meet Greg and Roger on an archery range at the lodge, and Sam confronts Greg with Hilla's pregnancy, surprising Roger. Greg admits he knew about the pregnancy and claims that he and Hilla were going to elope on the night she died. 
Sam argues that Hilla broke up with Greg on the 4th of July, but Greg responds that he was in an archery tournament in Boston that weekend, which Lyle confirms. Greg says that he and Hilla had just started dating at the time. Roger angrily tells Sam to get his facts straight. Back in Hilla's room, Sam is holding Hilla's locket and staring at Stephanie's picture of her. Al returns, and Sam admits that he's being a little irrational about Hilla. Al says that he agrees with Sam about Hilla being murdered, since he and Hilla are both orphans and should stick together. Al has Ziggy look into the people Sam has met on this leap, and discovers that in six years, Aggie is going to be indicted for performing an illegal abortion. Sam confronts Aggie at her beauty shop, and Aggie admits that Hilla came to her asking for an abortion and was accompanied by Roger Truesdale. Aggie says that Hilla couldn't go through with the abortion and left, which is the last time Aggie saw her alive. At the mortuary, Sam tells Lyle to arrest Roger for Hilla's murder, but Lyle refuses, telling Sam he has no weapon, no bullet, and no witness. He insists that Hilla committed suicide and orders Sam to bury her. Hilla is lying in her coffin and wearing her blue dress. Sam puts Hilla's locket around her neck, then notices something strange as he starts putting her shoes on. Later, Sam has gathered Lyle, Roger, Greg, and Stephanie in Hilla's room at the lodge, showing them the film of Hilla he watched earlier. Sam points out that the footage of Hilla by the lake was taken by an amateur, looking pointedly at Greg, who admits that he shot it. Roger insists that it doesn't prove that Greg killed Hilla. Sam tells Roger that he suspected him of shooting Hilla with an arrow, which would leave a similar wound to a bullet hole and explain the absence of a bullet, but then discovered that the arrows Roger uses at the lodge don't match the size of Hilla's wound. Sam then points out that the murderer shot the more professional-looking footage of Hilla in her Statue of Liberty costume and looks at Stephanie. Stephanie claims that she didn't shoot the film. Sam says that he thought Hilla had ended her relationship with Greg on the 4th of July, but that she actually ended her relationship with Stephanie. Greg is stunned, and Stephanie claims that she and Hilla were just friends. Not believing this, Sam says that things changed for Stephanie when Hilla fell in love with Greg. Stephanie claims that she hasn't shot anybody, and Sam shows her the shoe that was found near Hilla's body. He thought the shoe belonged to Hilla, but it wasn't her size. Sam guesses the shoe belongs to Stephanie, and that the point of the heel inflicted the wound to Hilla's temple. Sam asks Stephanie to try on the shoe, and she confesses to Hilla's murder, blaming Greg for getting Hilla pregnant so she could never leave him. Stephanie starts to cry as she says that she loved Hilla, but Hilla no longer loved her. Sam is standing at Hilla's grave when Al joins him. Sam says he doesn't think he did Hilla any good, but Al tells him that he did. Sam asks why he's still there, and Al says that maybe Sam needs to say goodbye to Hilla. Sam reads a passage from Hilla's book of Mark Twain that Twain wrote after his daughter died. He kneels down and places a bouquet of flowers on Hilla's grave, then leaps. And that episode recap was from Phil. Thank you, Phil. There's a lot going on in this episode, other than the murder mystery and different different things, a lot of things. I had a lot of thoughts on this, and they're all kind of all over the place, but I think equally as important. Hopefully, when I talk about them, they might weave together into something. Probably not. I'm so confused. <laughs> I have to say, I still thought he was a butcher the first time I watched it, even though we talked about it. But Butcher's apron and the blood and stuff. The- it's pretty gross that he wore well, the blood for Butchers the... do the same thing. It's a pig or a person, so. Except the end result is a little different, I think. Yeah. What were the big issues you saw in this episode? Well, I still don't think that I would be upset enough to take my shoe off and hit someone in the head with it. Yeah. Especially, like, the spiky heel of my shoe hit someone in the head with it. I Like, I don't ever see myself being that hurt. I guess that there has to be a precursor of that already in you to, like, I don't know. As far as Stephanie murdering Hilla, I really don't think she meant to hurt her, kill her. I think they just got in a fight. But, right? like, how mad do you have to be? Isn't that like a woman thing? You take off your shoe and throw it at somebody or, or hit them with it or something? I've never done that in my life. Well, you, you, you wear Nikes. That wouldn't hurt as much. <laughs> ah, that kind of hurt. It stung. You're, you're really s- lightweight rubber shoe. <laughs> now I have a tread mark on my face for the next 15 minutes. <laughs> well, but still, 
Like, that's not my first instinct. My first instinct would be, like, to push her off the dock. I don't think they were fighting on the dock, actually, because of the drag marks, so she... This, th- but that wasn't her shoe. There was no... Th- oh, there was drag right. marks, but They're... it wasn't her shoe. Oh, good point. Hmm. So they were fighting on the dock. Yeah, I, I, I think yeah. I think to hit somebody in the temple with a shoe that hard, I don't think you could do it on purpose unless you were awesome aim. It just kind of happened that it went to her temple. But like, you really have to want to harm someone to take your shoe off and, and hit them. Like, it wasn't like a... Yeah. Like a... I'm not sticking up for Stephanie at all. You know, killing anybody's wrong, no matter how you do it. Even hurting somebody's wrong. But in the moment, like, why didn't you just push her? I just, I must not fight like a heel taking off girl. I don't know. I just go to like, I would push her off the dock. If that was my heat of the moment fight move, as lame as that sounds, like I could see her like, you know, accidentally killing her because she got mad and like pushed her and she backed up and fell off the dock and hit her head and died or it's like something like that but right and that probably is more likely something that would happen in like say a lover's quarrel but then you wouldn't have this line of evidence and the eventual murder weapon and the misdirect with the arrow yeah it wouldn't have made for as interesting of a show i know but i'm just saying i've never been that angry (laughs) and what is it about people who think that if you don't love me, you can't love anyone else. You have to die. Like, <laughs> where does that come from? I don't know. Jealousy. Like, I don't think she meant to kill her. Yeah, but she was so hurt that Hilla didn't love her anymore. Mm-hmm. But like now she's dead and she really can't love you anymore. Like, wouldn't you rather the person you love be happy, be at least be alive? Yeah, because there's somewhat of a chance that you can still see them every day. Whereas if they're dead. That really kind of fizzles out any possibility of that relationship or rekindling. I think it was an accident. I still don't think you can accidentally kill someone with the heel of your shoe. No. (laughs) And uh, speaking of the heel of your shoe, at the end of the episode when he says that's the exact same size of the entry wound as Hilla's head, totally not, totally different. The one on Hilla's head was a round circle, more like the arrow, and it wasn't like a little horseshoe shape of a heel would be. So, whoops. Well, not all heels have a horseshoe the shape. The exact heel that they were showing on camera, though, that made the mark mm. and the mark in the door. So I liked how the door was constructed. It looked like the middle panel could be removable if they had to do that shot over and over again and it replaced. That scene right there, I don't know what it was about him putting the heel through the door, but that was like pretty dark. What about Sam getting there too late? I really think he was there too late. Why was he sent to solve the murder and not sent to prevent the murder? Yeah, I don't understand that. It doesn't really make sense to me. If you're time traveling and you have the ability, the only thing I can think of is either Hilla or Hilla's baby in the future does something horrible and so... Or Hilla's baby's baby. It's baby. It's baby. You never know. So that's the only reason I'm thinking that they didn't save Hilla. It's like the... Not to mention it again, but it kind of reminds me of eleven twenty two sixty three. how they kind of change things and then realize maybe that wasn't for the better, so they... Without giving any spoilers away. <laughs> spoilers. What? Is that really a spoiler? Uh, uh, yeah. Multiple timelines are kept getting reset. Yeah. That's, that's not a spoiler. No, it's a bit, that's, that's called a time travel. Moment. Time travel. <laughs> we love time travel. Speaking of, did you see X-Men Days of Future Past? It's pretty awesome. That would be a negative. So for some reason, he was there to catch Hilla's killer. From a writer standpoint, I think they were just trying to change it up. From the time travel standpoint, it's stupid, and I uh, think they, they should have saved her. Okay, I agree with you there. <laughs> um, I think that's the only explanation for him not saving Hilla is something Hilla did in the future or Hilla's baby. And I think that that's why Sam was so hung up on it, because he's so used to saving the person that he's there to save that this time he was too late. From a writing standpoint, like you said, it makes a great episode, and it's something out of the normal episode of Quantum Leap, which proves once again that they can really do anything in Quantum Leap. Anything. But whatever the reason, it made a really great show. Yeah, it was a good episode. I still, like, I felt for him that he was sad about it. And I did think he was getting a little obsessive, but... A little? But in his defense, if it was a murder mystery, like, in today's time, like, if it was an episode of CSI or something like that. They would have been in her room watching her movies and they would have been going through her stuff and reading her diary. So in all fairness, I don't think he was obsessing as much as he had to solve the crime. 
I think he got emotionally attached, which made it a little obsessive. But I think that he should have read her diary and he should have watched the movies because that's the only way he found the killer. I think the obsession part comes in with the repetitiveness of watching the film over and over and playing the record over and over and being in a room over and over. Or the fact that he like thought there was a weird connection. And can we talk about the weird, creepy five second loop of her in color that kept flashing in his head? Yeah, with the creepy like music in the background. What is that? That's one of the things that stands out in this episode is something non-quantum leapish. And I haven't seen this theory, but I, I personally think that Melvin, before Sam leaped into him, had maybe a picnic with Hilly because she's in a different outfit and it's in color and it's on a different day in a different place than we see in any other film or hear about anywhere. So I think it's just a little bit of Swiss cheese memories that Melvin has that maybe he took her for a picnic. My guess. I don't know. Where else would it come from? He's not psychic. Well, like, that's what I don't understand. And I talked to Hayden because I Hayden always has an opinion about stuff. And I was like, what is your thought? And he thought it was just like his imagination. But like, how do you how does that present itself? Like, you, how do you just imagine this girl on a field in a different outfit? Like you were saying, it's completely random. It's not like he's replaying the movie he's seen in his head. It's not even like he took the black and white film and kind of made it in color in his head. It's a completely different, random five second loop. I don't even know if it's five seconds, but it's a short loop of her and it's the same clip that plays every time and it's weird and there's creepy music and it's just, I feel like it was unnecessary, but it made you definitely think that he has some obsession with it. Like, I think it just furthered the obsession issue, but I also feel like it was unnecessary to get the point across. It also made you feel a little bit on tilt in this episode where you're kind of off balance and really you're not quite sure what's going on in the episode. So that gives it more of a creepy feeling. Speaking of that whole creepy feeling, I definitely thought like he was going to start hallucinating Hilly when Stephanie walked through and he thought it was Hilla standing there. I was like, oh, man, he's going to start hallucinating her now and asking her questions. Like, the, obviously, the first time I watched it, I thought that it was weird. I also thought maybe like he knew her like as a kid or something, you know, like maybe their paths had crossed at some point in his timeline, but that never came into anything. I don't know. It was just like they never explained why he was having these weird, creepy. It could be just Sam imagining what Hilla was like in life and we're seeing his imagination slash putting everything together. Yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like the episode would have been fine without it because I feel like it just left me with more questions about what that whole thing was. This episode definitely seems like a separate entity than the normal series. Right. And I like that. Like I mentioned earlier, I like that I didn't know who the killer was. I like that it wasn't a leap in, save the day kind of thing. As depressing as that is, because, I mean, at the end of the day, you want him to save the girl. But it was still made for a really good episode. Bunch of different things in this episode. I, I think they bring up abortion in this episode as maybe a possible reason for Aggie to be maybe the killer. Maybe something went wrong in the backstreet abortion. So that brought up her as a suspect. But I really don't think it, the episode was really about abortion. Definitely wasn't pro or against abortion. That wasn't an, an issue. But I think a issue that came up was the role of women in society and how they were treated at that time from everybody else. It was more about Roger trying to force Hilla to have an abortion. And I think that's a big topic of just women's rights in general and how they've been mistreated over the years. Well, for some reason... There was this cookie cutter way of doing things back then where you you dated, you got married, you had two and a half kids and lived with a white picket fence. And even if you weren't happy, that's how life was. And if you lived your life any other way than that, then you were ridiculed. So even Al mentions that women who were pregnant before marriage were outcasts. I don't know why. I'm glad that... Not that we've really changed that much as far as being judgmental of people that have different lives than ours. I mean, we're not as judgmental as a society now. I think we're more accepting of different lifestyles than we used to be. 
But the fact that it was not okay to have a baby before you got married, like, I don't think people were realistic in their sexual education (laughs) back then. It was like the, if we don't talk about it, maybe it won't happen. But obviously our society keeps going. So that uh, didn't work. And it's a real shame that women had to find someone to perform an abortion on them. What training, what medical training did Aggie have that she was giving abortions? She was a beautician. Okay. Oh, so she went to zero amount of medical school. I was curious because they only mentioned that Aggie did abortions and they didn't really go into it in this episode. So I was curious what a 1959 abortion would be like. Not that I have anything to compare it to now, really, but actually BuzzFeed has an account of a 74-year-old woman who went and had an abortion in 1959 at an apartment in the Bronx. So I read that and uh, it sounds like that would be actually pretty fitting in this episode. It's not as gruesome as I thought it was going to be. So that's good, I guess. I don't know. It just seems so scary that like there wasn't enough medical care for that to happen. (laughs) So but the woman in the article talks about how I think she had two abortions, one in 1959 and one later on. And the one later on, it was done like with her doctor in a hospital. So she didn't have to go back to an apartment somewhere with some random guy on a kitchen table. (laughs) So it sucks that as a woman today, to look back and see that a woman who got pregnant before you have a baby inside you. It's not like you (laughs) like all of a sudden all your rights are taken away from you when you're pregnant. You know what I mean? I just think that that's crazy but i'm glad that our society is changing so like i said the main thing i got out of this was the way women are treated in society oh yeah especially like a beautiful woman like her treated as like a object well just like they're less than a person they have no rights i touched on this a little bit in the americanization of machiko because there was a similar issue where the girl was pregnant and threw herself off a bridge thinking more on this i'm trying to think where our society got the idea that being pregnant or having a child is a bad thing. Because if you think about it, sex isn't bad. A baby isn't bad. Being pregnant isn't bad. Having a family isn't bad. Being in love isn't bad. Everything that's not bad, somewhere, thousands of years ago, groups of people arbitrarily got together and made up rules for other people's lives. And society has evolved. And until very recently, pretty much everybody went by the same rules. And they said, if you're pregnant before a certain age, you're bad. If you're pregnant and you're not married, you're bad. And I don't understand that. I really don't. How can good plus good plus good plus good equal bad? I'm sure we've talked about your mom on this podcast. She started her family when she was 16. She got married and she had her first kid at 16. I remember when I was 16 and I can't imagine like having to raise a kid at 16. But With that being said, your mom has had five kids since then, and she's an awesome person. So, like, was it really that bad that she had a kid at 16? No, I'm sure the hardest it was on on her, not anybody else. Like, it wasn't hard. I mean, like, I'm sure her parents and her husband's parents helped them out. But I mean, in all actuality, the only person it really it's the probably the most difficult on is the person who has the baby. So. Shouldn't it be their decision if they're going to get ridiculed? I don't know. I just, it it shouldn't matter if you're married or not, or if you're 16 or not, or whatever, if it's your decision to have a baby. And it's still a good thing. Even though it's very difficult on the person having the baby, it's the best thing in the world. Right. A baby is the best thing in the world. It's hard to explain to people that don't have a child, but once you have a baby, once you see that baby for the first time, you realize life is so much more better now. Well, I think because once you have been through it, you know how hard it is and you try to like warn the people that don't have them yet, like, hey, take a nap and sleep a little bit more and get your stuff together beforehand. But then you think that you're all knowing because you've been through it before, maybe. I don't know. Well, what I'm saying is like when Serenity falls asleep in my arms watching Jake and the Neverland Pirates, let's say, (laughs) and she's just sleeping in my arms, snoring away, happy. My best, happiest moment of my life. My joy is holding her. So how can Roger, having had a child, gonna 
be a grandfather because it's Greg's child, take her to go get an abortion instead of saying, let me go take you down to the local, whatever the target was back then, and get you a matching stroller and pack and play and crib and high chair and let's get this and let's get that. But you have to look at it from knowing what we know about Roger. He wasn't even willing to admit that him and Hilly were together because of social standards. So if you look at the way now, I don't know, because I'm not rich, so I don't really care what social standards say about me. But this has changed a lot in society, too, now, because I don't think that it's necessarily the same as it used to be. But a lot of high society people, they high society. they cover up a lot of mental illness. They make sure that everything looks good on paper. They make sure that, you know, everything looks good to everyone around them when usually on the inside of their family, it's crumbling mess. So as long as they look good to appearances on the outside, all is well. So Roger was even covering for Greg because he didn't want Greg and Hilly to even look like they were together, not because she was murdered or because she was dead and possibly murdered, but because he was, you know, the owner of a lodge. I don't really know who he is in the town except a rich dude who paid for a lot of stuff in the town. But obviously, in his book, Hilly was low common people. (laughs) So I think that it was more like my son isn't going to knock up some poor girl not like this is going to be my grandchild. Like, I, I don't think that that's what he thought at first. Not that that's right, but... Because society was influencing him to look good? Right, yes. Again, th- I know that's what it was like back then, but I couldn't understand that. I honestly don't care what my neighbor thinks about my family, as long as I'm happy with my family and I take care of my family. Right, and that's because you're awesome. Not that I'm biased. <laughs> but a lot of people don't have the same opinions as us, and... Even parenting back then was a lot different than it is now. And not that they didn't love their kids, but the way that we view parenting now was a lot different back then. So like him and his dad probably weren't as close as like, say, you and Rennie. So I think that that has something to do with it, too. It just seems sad. Oh, I agree. And it's also sad that Greg couldn't even grieve properly until after they found out like I don't even think in the original timeline he was probably even allowed to grieve for her because society standards <laughs> and his dad telling him to suck it up that's his girlfriend laying there with his unborn child yeah yeah his whole future is laying there on the table his family gone that would make anybody emotional yeah i felt really bad for him and that's what i'm saying that this episode besides the main big things you see in this episode are all these other things going on and the whys and the hows and there's a lot going on in this episode. And when your best friend slash lover comes to you and says, hey, I'm pregnant and I'm going to start this life with this new guy and I'm in love and it's the best thing that's ever happened to me and you hit her in the head with your shoe. Well, see, this is what I'm confused on, on the timeline of the whole episode, the diary. Yeah. It's in July. July 4th. So we have all of July, all of August, all of September, all of October, and the first week of November. We're at nothing in the diary and nothing that happened that I heard from any character about anything that happened in between there. Because Hilly broke it off with Stephanie, what, July 4th, right? Right. And this is November 9th. So she's still not over it enough to beat her in the head with the shoe. So in those four months, were they still friends Well, they still saw each other every day. They worked together. So, like, they had to be next to each other. But what I'm saying is, like, four months later, you've got to calm down a little bit. Like, you you haven't calmed down in four months. So, what was the catalyst for this fight happening? Was it because Hilla told Stephanie that she was pregnant? Yeah, I'm assuming. So, did she just now get pregnant? I don't think she was very far along. I think she found out, went to get an abortion, told Stephanie that she wasn't getting the abortion died right in the first week of november yeah okay happy birthday it was hill's birthday yeah and coincidentally sam had mentioned that it was hill's birthday and i was like it was just somebody's birthday not too long ago and i thought about it and i'd remember robert duncan mcneil his birthday had just passed so i looked it up his birthday is november 9th the leap date weird that is weird right and it's not in any of the trivia anywhere hmm. 
So it's something I figured, out, you. I figured out on my own. It's what you get for being obsessed with Star Trek. <laughs> well, I just emailed uh, Mr. McNeil to uh, see if I could get him on the show. Oh. And then uh, I saw that his birthday was coming up. So hopefully all this is kind of uh, going to weave together somehow. There's a lot in this episode. Of course, this is the only episode that we know of so far that has a confirmed gay character in it, which would be Stephanie. Thank you for the clarification. <laughs> a bisexual character of Hilla. Right. And uh, a lot of people are upset that the one time so far you see a gay character, she's the murderer. Which, when you first think about it, to me, it is like uh, saying, okay, here's a gay character, oh, and they're bad. I have to disagree with you. Okay. My my whole thought was the only way they could have pulled off this episode is if her other lover was female because you didn't suspect it. If there was another guy in the picture because we're just tuned to in Quantum Leap so far, there have been men and women together. Not that it, it would be bad. I mean... It's not bad for men and women to be together at all. No, no, no. no. But I mean, like... I like that they introduced a gay character in the storyline because go Quantum Leap. I mean, it was the early 90s. So awesome for having that on regular television. I do understand that it does kind of make her look bad. But the only way they would have been able to pull off the switcheroo of you not knowing who killed her is if Stephanie was gay. If there was another guy in the picture, you would have suspected him right away. Well, I think there was another guy in the picture because it could have been the father. No, I mean, at the moment where... With the two lovers? Yeah. It could have been the sheriff, the way the guilty looks he was given the whole episode. But at the moment when he says, no, I wasn't here on 4th of July, that's when we first started dating, who did you suspect? Nobody, right? No one. Exactly. Because you didn't suspect Stephanie because you just thought they were friends. If that was a guy you would have suspected him. Probably. That's why the killer had to be gay in this episode. Not that the killer had to be gay because gay people are bad, but because the only way the storyline would have worked is if Stephanie was a female who was in love with Hilla. That's a very good point. But my first time watching it, I was like, it's a gay character, which is awesome, but she's the killer, which kind of makes gay people look bad. But Sam doesn't treat anybody differently in the episode. Because of that. So that's good. Oh, yeah. But after thinking about this for a long time and watching the show, I hate to jump the timeline in Quantum Leap and skip around, skip ahead maybe, but there's a great quote in one of the episodes coming up called Black on White on Fire. It's not about who you love. It's about black and white. But I think the quote applies. And uh, Sam says it in the episode, but it was written by Deborah Pratt, of course, the great Deborah Pratt. In this episode... One of the characters says, talking about raising a half-black, half-white child, that they're not going to fit in no matter where they go. And it's because that wherever they go, uh, they won't be black and they won't be white. And um, Sam replies, they'll be human. And the mama says, of course they'll be human, child. I'm talking about race. Sam says, I know, but maybe if we teach our kids to say that they're human instead of black or white, red or yellow, maybe race won't matter. They're human. So... If you apply that view to everyone that's human, and we've said this many times, it might be, in fact, where I got people are people, which is one of my favorite sayings. It doesn't matter that they're gay. It doesn't matter that they're bisexual. And they're not a bad person, killer, because they're gay. They just happen to be gay and a killer. So I think if you, at first glance, you think about it, it's bad appearances for a gay character. But if you think about it further, it doesn't matter who they love. It just matters that that person happens to have killed someone else. Yeah. I still like my theory. <laughs> so, I mean, what is your thought on that? In other words, if you were to do blind casting in real life. Yeah. It wouldn't matter. Oh, no, I, I don't think it matters. But I still just think that Stephanie had to be gay in this episode for it to work out from a writing standpoint. Basically, what I'm asking you is, do you think that the killer being a lesbian in this episode is a bad thing. I don't think that it's bad that she's a killer in this episode and she's gay. Maybe that's because I don't think of that being a big deal. I think that I saw recently, I, now I don't know, I didn't hear this quote, but it was like one of those internet memes that Alicia Moore, aka Pink, said, okay, I'm paraphrasing here, but you should definitely go watch 
the video, you can uh, Google Pink's HRC speech, acceptance speech, I guess. She's like, hi, I'm Alicia. I'm a Virgo. I'm 33 and I'm gay. And everybody, you know, cheers for all that. And then she says, actually, I'm not. But I would like the same response for hi, I'm a Virgo to be for, you know, hi, I'm gay. So when you meet someone, you're like, hi, I'm gay. And they're like, yeah, that's great. Awesome. Hey, nice to meet you. Which is kind of how I view things. I'm like, hey, cool. I you like boys too, or you like girls? <laughs> that's cool. Like I, I don't really care. I don't think that who you love should matter. I feel like in this case, I don't know if like you. I I know earlier you called Hilly bisexual, but it, they explain that she was raped and couldn't even be around men, so she found love in women, basically. And I feel like that's pretty much kind of how everybody should just view love is whoever you are you want to be with you're with she found a guy that she loves so she's with that guy but before that she was with stephanie like she just was with who she loved to be with right so she was just with whoever it wasn't like oh i found a guy now so i'm gonna leave you because this is the social standard it was like i found a guy to love I found a girl, you know, like, I don't think it... A person. Right. I got you. So I understand what you're saying. I feel like the killer being gay in this episode doesn't represent gay people in a bad light because I feel like it wasn't because she was gay that she killed Hilly. Like, I don't think that one had to do with another. If it was another guy that killed her, it would have still had the same effect but you wouldn't have that surprise element because you would have suspected him sooner. And maybe one day in the future or today by younger people, they might watch and go, oh, it was Hilly because she's the other person. Just assuming that it's just as equal chance of her loving a man or a woman. Right. So that would be cool. Well, Hilly clearly states that they were friends and tries to come up at the friend angle. So you might still not suspect it because you think that they're friends which i think was the code word back then okay (laughs) um yeah i don't know i just feel like i don't think that it brought any bad light to her character being gay like i said there's a lot of differing opinions on this topic on this episode but that's what i eventually reached in my thought process for this episode was that one was disconnected from the other right The one problem I did have in the episode was when the character of Greg says she was raped and that's why she couldn't trust men and kind of almost giving that as a reason for being with a woman. And that's like an old stereotype that, well, something bad must have happened to her for her to become a lesbian instead of just that's how people are born. But then you have Stephanie who didn't have anything wrong with her. Like if they had said, well, Stephanie was raped too, so that's why she became a lesbian also. Look at Hilly, right? She lost her whole family. So she has no loving, tender care. So World War II, if this is the war they're referring to, which I'm assuming, ended 14 years before this. So she was five when she lost her whole family. So growing up as an orphan, she hasn't really had that motherly love kind of thing. Probably most males that she's been around have taken advantage of her beauty. Not saying that'll turn you into a lesbian, but it'll probably make you avoid men in general. Well, don't most women avoid men in general because of that? (laughs) (laughs) I don't think so. I don't know. I feel like she spent more time with women and just naturally formed relationships with them. Because I feel like I've known people that had healthy heterosexual relationships and then had ha- healthy homosexual relationships. And it it wasn't like they suddenly were gay. They just found someone. Right. I mean, it, uh, people are people. Right. I don't know if I just have a different opinion of it going in than you do. They didn't mean harm. I don't know. Like, I don't think Quantum Leap was as judgmental as that. Or maybe I'm just wishful thinking that they weren't really. Well, we're trying to apply... 2014 logic to a 1990 show about 1950s i don't know i was raised this show started when my life began (laughs) as weird as that is i grew up around 
gay couples. I'm from New Jersey and there's this cute little town of Ocean Grove that has lots of lovely gay hotel owning couples. <laughs> Bed and breakfast owning. They're like it's it's like a perfect romantic story. And my grandma lived there and she had lots of like gay couple friends and I just thought that that was a thing. We went to their house for dinner and they like had a house and they were like had furniture together and I didn't realize some people thought of it as weird. I honestly like thought they were married. Like I didn't even know that like that wasn't even a thing because from my earliest memories, like while I was probably four or five, I think when my grandma moved to Ocean Grove, like that's just how I thought. I don't know. I didn't I wasn't like, where's the wife? I just thought that they were together and married. And one of my childhood friends, his mom left his dad for another woman and they were together. From my earliest memories, I've been exposed to all sorts of relationships. And so I never really thought of it like that. Okay. But that's good that that's the way you view it because you're younger. And that's the way I view it because I hopefully have a more modern way of thinking about it. It's very scattered all over the place, our thoughts, but they're all pertaining to this episode. I think it's because we're passionate about it. I don't think Maybe. it's bad. I don't have organized conversations. <laughs> <laughs> normal people don't, I guess. <laughs> so that's a normal thing. So I don't think this situation would necessarily happen today. Why not? Because you wouldn't have the parents of people trying to hide things. You wouldn't have forcing somebody to get an abortion. You wouldn't separate people because of their class and society. You don't watch Gossip Girl. I do not. Just saying. <laughs> There's still a lot of um, society type of things going on, but not where we live. I don't think well, we're not exposed to that kind of society norm. But according to Gossip Girl, no, that's a really good source that I have. But XOXO? Yeah, exactly. No idea. Um, not that that show really pertains to this audience, but it kind of shows the Upper East Side teenagers and rich people of New York. So I'm sure there's a little crossover. I think that it's not as bad, but I also think that people still do get secret abortions, not necessarily secret to the medical community, but secret to their families. And I still think that people have secret relationships and it still could probably happen today, just not as common, I guess. We're not a perfect society yet. <laughs> Can we learn from this episode? As a society? Well, I would hope so. <laughs> as an individual, I can. I know for a fact that my daughter will know that if and when she becomes pregnant, she can come to me and tell me and I will hug her and help her in any way I can. Oh, yeah. And that's what you need when you're pregnant. You don't need people treating you badly because you're going to bring a new person into the world. That's not a bad thing. People are weird. Right? People in general when you're pregnant are weird. For some reason, the moment you tell people you're pregnant, your entire existence is skewed. It's very strange. Were there any other topics in this episode that were brought up? Cops trying to cover up the rich guy of the town? I don't know. <laughs> there was some glances. I don't think any words were really spoken. They both Well, no, he said, don't forget that Mr. Truesdale was the reason you're the coroner. I think they both accused each other of being owned by Mr. Truesdale. Hmm. I don't think that would have... Well, who knows? I don't know. I don't know any rich people. I don't know how that applies. <laughs> I, I do, but he doesn't know he's rich, so it doesn't count. Oh, okay. See, there you go. <laughs> He doesn't, he doesn't apply to societal norms either. Yeah. Great guy. I had you read the sequel to this episode, which was in comic book form. It's issue number nine of Innovation Comics Quantum Leap. That's the one we gave out for our essay contest that some of our listeners received. So you guys should go read it like now. It's always interesting. We always have this thought in our head, wondering what happened to the characters afterwards. And at least in this instance, we found out through a comic book. I don't usually read comic books, but I read this one. Not, not that I don't like them. I just like have never really been into it. I did read some Serenity ones, but but you asked me to read this one because it was a sequel. So I read it and it's it's actually pretty short, but sweet. It's a good one. I really liked it. I, I liked seeing Stephanie after the episode. That was really cool. I'm glad that Sam was able to help Stephanie and leap back into her storyline. That was pretty cool. And I like that she was able to help the LGBTQ community before it was that. 
<laughs> I thought it was cool that she ended up doing some good after she got out of prison. So Yeah, it's weird because um, Sam leaping into Stephanie, you're rooting for the person who in the episode was the murderer, which is kind of weird. But when we met her, she already did it. Does that matter? No, I don't think so. When, once you kill somebody, <laughs> you kill somebody. Yeah. You know? So that that part was kind of weird for me. Yeah. We saw a lot more examples of prejudice in that. But also your comment earlier about how they like wrote the killer as a gay person and making her look bad kind of. If that was what happened, the comic book definitely redeems that, right? I think so. She had to go to prison because she committed murder. But when she got out, it definitely makes her not look so bad in the in the end, right? It's worth the read, I think. If you like this episode of television, it's worth getting that comic and I think if you like out. Quantum Leap in general, the comic book is is awesome just because it's a continuation that we don't get to see on TV. Having read them now, I really like them. They fit into the universe pretty good. Yeah, I, I that was, I think, the first Quantum Leap comic I've read, mostly because I think most of them would probably... Maybe. It'd be a little spoilery. Maybe. Maybe. We'll get there. Oh, yeah. But I really did like it. I wasn't sure how I was going to like it because I'm used to seeing them on screen. I still could kind of visualize. It's funny because the the pictures in the comic, because he's a woman, it, it's like a drawing of Sam with a wig on. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's why Stephanie was wearing a wig, so you could see Sam as a girl. Yeah, it was kind of weird. Like, why would Stephanie need a wig? Don't know. <laughs> she had some pretty long hair in the episode, so. The promoter for her was trying to just make her look different, change her name, change her look. Stephania. Yeah, add an A, I guess. That's weird. Yeah, it's weird. That's weird art New York people. I don't know. Andy Warhol makes a guest appearance in it. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, something to check out. If you didn't win one from the essay contest, you're going to have to find it the old-fashioned way on eBay. eBay. Or check out your local comic book shop. <laughs> the old-fashioned eBay. <laughs> <laughs> the old-school way to find a comic book. Let's talk a little bit more in specifics about the episode. Did you see anything interesting in the episode you want to talk about? I do have one. Okay. That I saw on the last time I watched it. In the beginning, when Lyle is showing Sam slash Melvin the purse, the shoe, and the jacket that he found on the dock, he has the shoe, and he's talking about the shoe, and that he only found one, and Marsha Cross's name shows up on the screen. And I was like, really? hey, hey, that's pretty cool. I did not even catch that. What? That's pretty cool. Yeah, so Marsha Cross's name is like on the screen. Wow, that's like a uh, big hint, maybe? Or we'd only see that if you saw the episode before, maybe? Well, considering this is the third time I've watched it and I just saw it for the first time, it was probably coincidental, but I just thought it was really cool. I know if I was doing the titles, I might throw that in, in that order. I don't know if they had to do it contractually by alphabetical order or order of appearance or something like that. I don't know. I just thought it was pretty cool that they're talking about the shoe and Marsha Cross's name comes up. And you don't find out until the end of the episode that it's her shoe. So you wouldn't know, but I still think it's cool. Like if they had an arrow pointing from Marsha Cross to the shoe. <laughs> yeah, well, it's literally like as he's holding the shoe, it's it, her name is on the screen. So Originally talking about the shoe, I had this thought of how could she leave the dock area and not realize she didn't have a shoe on? Because especially high heels like that, you're going to be walking with like a limp if you only have one heel on. But then later on, I realized that the sheriff said it was underneath the dock. So maybe she couldn't find the shoe when she left. Oh, I'm assuming she couldn't find it. And that's why she went to go get it. Oh, is that why she visited Hilly, you think? For the specific reason of getting the shoe back? Oh my gosh, yeah. Okay. Well, okay. Maybe not the reason to visit her. But once she saw the shoe, that's why she was like, oh, I have to take all this stuff to clean it. Oh, yeah, definitely. She's trying to take evidence. Yeah. It's odd that uh, Sam didn't realize that the shoe was too big. I don't think he was paying attention to her feet until he was putting her shoes on. And what about that? When he was putting Hilla's shoes on in the coffin, he said, oh, Hilla. Why did he say that? Because he realized what had happened? I think he realized everything at that moment. I think that everything just set into place and he was just like, ah, oh, that sucks. Like he knew he was right that somebody had murdered her and how yeah. tragic the whole situation was. I don't know. What's worse, if someone random kills you or if someone 
that loves you kills you? Like, what is, what's more tragic? They're both bad, but I think if somebody that loves you kills you because you trust them. Yeah. It, it's really sad that for both of them, like, I mean, obviously it's sad for Hilla because she's dead. And it's sad for Greg because that's his whole world gone. But for Stephanie, it's sad too because like we've both said, I don't think that she meant to kill her. I don't think she wanted to kill her. Doesn't make it right or no. can't excuse her in any way because she still ruined Greg's world and Hilla's world. Well, right. And also hers because she killed the woman she loved. Like, I don't think it was on purpose, even though I still don't know how you accidentally take off your shoe and kill someone. I think someone. she meant to hurt her, just not to kill her. Definitely a heat of the moment thing. But yeah, I, I think it's sad. The whole situation is sad. But I know that Sam was right in the fact that she was too alive to kill herself. So to have someone that loved her kill her was just sad. So I think that that's why he said that. The sheriff wasn't a very good investigator in this episode. He really left it all to Melvin. He wasn't really, he didn't really have many skills with that. He was like, uh, she was found alone, so it must have been a suicide. Again, to mention life on Mars, but did it remind you of life on Mars when they're like, what? Just let it go and... You know how they were so I, like... I guess police work back then. Yeah. Yeah, it was just like, oh, that's the easiest explanation right now. It's the thing I can write down on a piece of paper where I don't have to do any more work. Right. Kind of kind of weird, kind of sad. Sam's like, no, we have to figure this out. Everybody right. else is like, why? She's already dead. The sheriff, played by W.K. Stratton, he was in Genesis, the first episode, which is a weird tie-in to this quote. He says in this episode, remember last summer there was a boy who was hit by a speedboat? Yeah. That immediately made me think of in the Genesis with W.K. Stratton also, where they talk about Mikey being hit by the bus. It's weird that they didn't say the bus, like why it was a speedboat. Now it's a speedboat. So I wonder if boys are going to be hit by different vehicles going forward in the different Quantum Leap episodes. How tragic. It is, but it's weird, right? Is that me or am I seeing a connection where none exist? It's weird. But I also didn't want to picture a little boy getting hit by a speedboat, so I feel like that was another unnecessary detail in the episode. (laughs) It's just like somebody's like, no, put it in there. Trust me. It'll pay off in the end. I don't know. Is there a season four episode about Sam going around hitting people in boats and buses and stuff? I don't know. I don't know, but that's a very tragic theory. (laughs) Luckily, Mikey's all right. Yeah. Other guy, probably not so much. Probably not. Little technical things I saw in this episode. Hilly, her jaw was closed and real dead people, their jaws slacked open. But that would make it her look really gross on the table instead of looking beautiful like Never they were going Never seen for. that. And yeah, they usually don't show that on television. Weird facts that you know. I just know it from watching different uh, special effects makeup documentaries and they explain. There should be like a podcast dedicated <laughs> to the weird things you know about. <laughs> <laughs> like dead people's jaws. It, it just, uh, I'm glad they didn't do it that way because she wouldn't look as pretty as she did. And they Some couldn't things, have done that dissolve yeah. from her laying on the slab to the film of her waving the flag. Can we talk about the fact that I hate that part of the episode every time I watch it? Yeah, it's weird, right? It freaks me out because, first of all, the picture of her on the table is like a weird film. Like they use a completely different camera or something. It's like this weird grainy blue shot that they did. And then it's too long on her dead face. Like they transition into her smiling face and it's too long in between. If you're going to transition from like dead her to happy alive her, make it a faster transition. That part bothers me every time. Before watching the end of this, did you notice there was two different photographers for the film? Not even a little bit. No, not until Sam says it. Uh, A couple things in the film that I looked at, like if this was CSI or NCIS, they'd be examining the film, blowing different things up. They'd get a reflection off the locket of who was filming. It'd be a whole other storyline almost. Things I looked at were the American flag. It had the right amount of stars for the year. Which was? 48. Hmm. In a few years, it'd be 49 and then 50. Is it bad that I I didn't even think about like Hawaii not being part of the country that long? It's one of those things that hit me and I decided, you know what, I'm going to pause it and check. And they had it right. So good job on them. The other thing that I found interesting was the film at the end, when it runs out, there's something written on the film. I guess like a developer would write something on there. It's on the quantumleappodcast.com website, but I have no idea what it says. Hmm. Maybe it's in German. Oh, it might be. Wow. I'm so smart. You are. Okay. So we talked about 
Stephanie being the red herring when obviously she wasn't the she red herring. She was not. <laughs> but now I know that a herring is a fish. Mm-hmm. But on Roger Truesdale's tie, there was a red bird. Red and bird. I was like, that's kind of like a red something. Something. Like a red herring. But because he was, for me, probably the biggest red herring of the episode. And so I, I thought it was kind of cool that they at least incorporated like red into his outfit. Might have been something. Uh, you taught me this that usually they're like red hair or red something. Almost always. Yeah. So there is a red bird on his tie in the first scene where they're at the mortuary. Did that make you think it was him? No, but that made me think he was the red herring <laughs> because he was wearing red. What made me think that he did it or he could have done it was he offered to pay for her funeral. Right. Which to me is indicative of guilt. Guilty. Right. So that was a big clue to me that it was him. Yeah, I'll pay for it. Make it go away. <laughs> yep. It's all good. Just bury her. When in reality, he was just trying to cover up his son's affair. I don't know. It's just a normal dating. I don't know why it was so scandalous. Again, uh, we're from different worlds of today and back then. Yeah, that's a good thing. That is <laughs> it's a not a bad thing. thing. If if it was back then, I don't think we'd be doing this show. They'd be like, did you hear what they were saying on all their episodes? <laughs> yeah. We might have to do something. But even if he was the killer, I feel like he would have gotten away with it. I think that even if he was the killer, I don't think that Lyle would have arrested him. That's a good point. I think that he paid a lot of money to that town to not be arrested. <laughs> so... Do you think Lyle would have arrested him if he was the killer? I think so. The way he was adamant about not being owned. Oh, uh, yeah, just to prove a point. And maybe. really, once you arrest him, he can't do anything to you anymore. I really thought that Roger Truesdale thought that Greg might have been the one that killed her. So I think that's why Roger was acting the way he was, because I think he was trying to cover for his son. Isn't that weird when that happens? <laughs> Does <laughs> like that happen a lot? No, like that, that's been like plots in things mm-hmm. I've seen before where someone's trying to cover for... One of the biggest clues that Sam got first off that she didn't commit suicide was the scratches on the heels. And he got that information from Stephanie. So again, if Stephanie had not said anything or not come by, who knows where those events would have led. Yeah, but it's funny that they like assume that they're drag marks when it's just scuffs on Stephanie's shoes. But we don't know that's true or not. That might have been just something that Stephanie said to get the heel. We don't know how much she lied about. What did you think was on the piece of paper in the diary before he said it? I had no idea. I just thought it was a receipt or something. You didn't think it was like a pregnancy test Not confirmation? At Not at all. Usually, nowadays, you got the plus or the minus or the electronic beep. <laughs> Is there an electronic beep? Yeah, there's one with a, like an LCD display and all kinds of stuff. Oh, fancy. I had no idea what it was going to be, but I, I didn't suspect pregnancy test either. If Sam wasn't a doctor, he might not have connected that to something else either. Well, I know what HCG levels are. What are they? Well, I just mean I know that they mean (laughs) pregnancy. I know what they mean. Home and garden. HCG stands for human chorionic gonadotropin. So much easier to say HCG. But I know that that's the hormone produced in pregnancy. Because that's like the levels that they check for pregnancy tests. Hmm. Still, to this day, that's how they check for pregnancy. But I didn't know it was going to be on a receipt paper. (laughs) But you know what it meant. Yeah. Like when he said that her, whatever he said about her HCG levels, I was like, oh, she's pregnant. And then Al was like, in English, please. To me, it was odd that that was in the diary pretty much in the July 3rd entry, either about a zoo or about going to the picnic. You want to elaborate on that for everyone else? (laughs) Um, The diary is written in German. I do know that. (laughs) And as Sam's reading it, he's hearing Hilla's voice. But in English, reading the German because Sam can understand German. But apparently he can't because he got it totally wrong. (laughs) I I wanted to, I had heard that it was wrong. So I wanted to verify what they actually said on the diary. And so I enlisted the help of the German speaking Scott Bakula fan group on Facebook. Thank you very much, guys. This was translated for us by Stella Aurelia Gibbis. Beginning of July, in the zoo, three little bears and a zebra were born. Anton was there yesterday and told me his whole family went with him, and they had lots of fun. 2nd July. Today we drove to the Kemsey, a lake. There we visited the castle, then went out for lunch. It was a gorgeous day. My thought on that is it was probably actually someone's diary that they just used for the shot. My thought was they had multiple pages in the diary, so it wasn't just two pages that were written on. They had some before and some after. 
And since nobody on the set spoke German, actually read German, which they would have nowadays had that, they just opened to one page that they thought might be that. Yeah, that makes sense, too. Even though I don't really think that she was going to castles or zoos. But <laughs> hey, whatever. At least it wasn't like Ilum Ipsum. I can't translate it into German. <laughs> Google Translator would be like, yeah, this isn't real. <laughs> These aren't real words. Or like just scribble on a page. At least it was like something there. Thank you to that group because that's awesome. They did really good with the mirror gag in this one. And I noticed that they showed more of Melvin in this episode than they did of George Washkey in the last episode, which I thought was kind of weird, but George Washkey wasn't really around a lot of mirrors. But they showed Melvin not in mirrors in this episode. I don't know why. But the mirror gag was good because it looked really nice. They did really good. They're getting better with every episode. But I saw Sam's apron corner in the mirror. Right. So there was someone walking next to Melvin that had another apron on in the mirror. Which your theory is that they're just standing like next to each other. Right. That's how they do that. Right. They stand shoulder to shoulder pretty much. They were standing a little too close in this shot. Yeah. But it works out well. You can see the bottom corner of another apron coming from the side of the mirror where Scott Bakula would be standing to pull off this mirror gag. It gives it away a little bit, but I didn't notice it at all until you pointed it out. And it doesn't like take anything away from me. I think it's cool that I saw that because they figured out a good way to do the mirror gag. So good for them. (laughs) That and uh, in Hilla's apartment, they do a little like pan and... Scott Bakula and the actor who plays Melvin Switch, real quick. Yeah. At first I thought it was a panwich, but I didn't see a cut in there at all. But uh, there, like I you said, I, I didn't know there was a thing. Oh, panwich is when you take one pan and you cut in between the pan to another pan you film. So it has a different beginning and ending. So there are two pans put together in the middle. I feel like there should be cheese involved. Um, I learned the term from the movie Serenity because they do a panwich around a hallway because... Uh, the Serenity set is on one level, but the Serenity ship is on two levels. So to go through all through the ship in the movie, in the opening of the movie, they have to do a panwich. Hmm. I feel like that's what a grilled cheese should be called, though. <laughs> panwich. A grilled any sandwich. Yeah. I totally thought that the bullet brooch thing that Hal was wearing was like a nipple. I don't know what that has to do with anything, but to me, it looked like a nipple. He wears it a lot in the series, and to me, it looks like a bullet. That's like, probably what it is. To me, it was silver and it looked like a bullet hit like you would see on the gold. T-1000. Yeah, I don't know. I just think it looks like a nipple. I don't really have anything else to add to that <laughs> except that it looks like he's wearing a nipple brooch. Usually I'm the one that sees the nipples. I think you're a bad influence. <laughs> I found it weird that Sam did an exploratory surgery on Hilla's head, but she looked <laughs> the same after he was done. But they didn't show that side of her head again. Oh, the side with the bullet hole, with the heel hole, with the arrow hole? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know how you would do it. I know nowadays on CSI, they would just like cut the skin off the skull and saw the skull and all kinds of gross stuff, which I wouldn't, I don't blame Al. I wouldn't want to be there either to see that. Yeah. My only thought on that was maybe he did an x-ray before he did the surgery and saw some of the metal shrapnel that was behind her ear and just cut it out from behind her ear. I'm going to say no. No, you don't no. think so? Uh, did you see any x-ray machines? No, but he is not only a mortician, he's also the coroner, so he would have access to one, possibly. That was my only way I could figure out where she wasn't totally messed up from him trying to find the bullet. I don't think he went that far in. Like, I think he followed the bullet hole and didn't find a bullet. But then he was in the temple and how he got to the ear, I don't know. Well, unless he just went under her scar because he thought, like, maybe... The bullet, something happened with her scar. Like, I don't, I don't know. I think they just avoided that. A little confusing. But I have to say, as a viewer of television back then and today, I like it better the older way because I know... Because you didn't want to see the inside of her skull? No. Like, yeah. if I'm watching a lot of the procedural shows today and they start showing gross stuff like that, like on Bones or CSI, it's not my favorite part. You shouldn't watch Bones then, like, yeah. as a whole. <laughs> if you don't like that, that's not your thing. You I like the just... mystery. I like the actors, the characters. It's just when they do the gross stuff, I'm like, I like... Just blur it out. Can I can you put, like, a blur over the... <laughs> kind of look at my phone while they're doing that. Yeah, I know. You know what you're talking about. I'm good with that. You don't like the melting flesh no, of Bones? No, might be a good radio drama. Mm. Bones. Yeah. I'd watch you that. should suggest that. <laughs> Can we have the bones without the bones? Yeah. Ooh, I'm sure there's a way. <laughs> 
did you think the arrow was a good misdirect? Oh, yeah. That was like amazing because the hole that I saw, and as soon as you see the archery range. Yeah, you're like, like, oh, that's it. That's why there's no bar- Yeah, there's no bullet. Because those arrows look like a bullet on a stick. Right. So, but you pull it back out. Exactly. And there's no evidence. But uh, that was a great misdirect. Hella had a burnt doll. Yes, she did. Which was the only thing that she had from her childhood and her life that was happy before she lost her whole family. Right. I found that interesting because I have a burnt doll. But you still have all your family. Why do you have a burnt doll? I mentioned this once before, but I had a fire that burnt down my house on Christmas Eve of 2000, I want to say, or is about to be 2000. And amazingly, the only thing that survived the fire were family photos, which are irreplaceable. So I found myself very fortunate there. And my Cabbage Patch doll, which was on my waterbed, and my waterbed didn't burn because I guess that doesn't happen in fires. They got there quick enough to put the fire out to where my waterbed didn't burn down. It got really scorched. But the Cabbage Patch doll was on my waterbed, so he's got a little bit of smoke damage. And at the time when I was going through my stuff and throwing everything away, I was like, you know, he's not that bad off. So I think I'll try to clean him up and save him. Uh Uh-uh. Uh, there, there's uh, more about that doll. If you, if you care to know more about my Cabbage Patch doll, I'll put a link up in the show notes to the little sample of my biography. About your doll. About my doll. He has a long history. He does. So what do you think of that backdrop outside of Hilly's apartment? It was like weird. It was definitely too close to the camera. Yeah. Well, it was too close to the set. <laughs> like if it was further out the window, <laughs> it wouldn't be so bad. But I think it was like a foot and a half outside the window. I can't say that this happened, but I had the feeling that the background would shake every time they opened the door. (laughs) Probably. Yeah, it was pretty close. But again, a difference in standard definition, high definition. Should the blue dress with the bow have been a clue that they were both her lovers? Yes. They both cared about her enough to know that. But I feel like you and my best friend... If you both had to pick an outfit for me to get buried in, I feel like my best friend would have picked a dress and you would have been like, I don't know. I would have been like, usually she tries something on and throws it on the ground and says, I have nothing to wear. Yeah. So I wouldn't know. Melissa would have definitely been able to be like, this is what you should bury her in. Why are we talking about this? No, but I mean, yeah, I'm not. Okay. I'm just saying that obviously that was really her favorite dress because she might have worn it all the time or she might have been, this is my favorite dress. If Stephanie and her were best friends, she would have known that regardless. Do you think that anybody figured out who done it before the reveal took place? Because no. I didn't watching it as a kid. I almost didn't watching it again as an adult because even though I knew who did it because it's a very memorable episode, there were so many people it could have been. In my head, I thought I might have remembered it wrong. Well, I kind of thought Stephanie, but I didn't think they were lovers. I think the first time I thought that Stephanie was jealous or that I thought that now that she was pregnant, they weren't going to have their like New York dream. I didn't go the lover route. I went with the Stephanie killed her because now that she's pregnant and settling down, she's not going to be able to go to New York and be a model and she's ruining my dream. That's where I kind of went with that like angry best friend thing. I didn't go with she's leaving me for this guy four months ago yeah this episode for me brought up a little technical question i have when you hear the sound of al arriving is it when al arrives it makes a sound or is it when sam sees al something makes a sound or is the sound not even there and it's just to let the viewers know that was weird in this episode because sam asks how long he's been standing there and it was from before the sound because as of up until this point I assumed that it was when Al arrived, even if you didn't see him right away. But in this episode, I feel like they put the sound in there, like, randomly. They were just like, oh, we forgot to put the sound in. Just put it in there. It's fine. Put it in there when you first see him, even though he's been listening in the closet. Or does the sound come from his hand link? And he's just like, boom, I'm here. (laughs) Well. I know if I had a sound I could play whenever I entered a room, I would. But if you think back to me asking you the same question, basically, in Another Mother, it didn't play because he was in the other room with Teresa, even if all of a sudden Sam saw him. So I think that was like a boo-boo Maybe. in this episode. I'll, I'll chalk it up to that. And if we find out different, I'm sure uh, Hayden will enlighten us. I was just about to say, I'm sure <laughs> Hayden has something to say about it. Isn't it great having a Hayden? Everybody should have a Hayden. He's just like our expert. Yeah, on it's good to have All him. things Quantum Leap. 
speaking of Al, I really like the reveal of Al behind the sheriff, how he was standing directly behind the sheriff. So when the sheriff moved out of the way, when Sam got upset that the sheriff was accusing him of having feelings for Hilla. That was a cool little trick. Yeah, I like when they do that where they don't have to rely on special effects. Because I don't think they're necessary anymore. There was no sound there. See, maybe that that was the sound they wanted to put in, but they didn't. (laughs) (laughs) Al, in this episode, one thing I really did enjoy was when he was trying to get Sam to give up on Hilla at first, and Sam wouldn't. Al smiled like, wow, you're you're such a good guy that you're going to see this to the end. And I think that's what swayed Al into jumping sides and believing Sam knew what was going on when they didn't. Well, that really shows their relationship, too, because all in all, they're best friends and they're in this together, basically. And Al backing up Sam is powerful in this episode because it does look like Sam's getting a little crazy. Very obsessed. Yeah. That's one of the things sitting there, the record player kept fooling me because when you're watching a television show, there's usually music going on. So you just, you don't realize there's music going on because your brain goes, oh, there's music in TV shows. So every time they would lift the needle off the record player or the record would end, I'd be like, oh yeah, that's the music. I do miss the smell and sound of film projectors, record players, that whole environment. That's something you don't get from this episode, only seeing it visually, is you don't get the smell and the sense of that old technology and how it worked, and maybe that was part of the reason why Sam was getting so sucked in. If the listeners know it, they're smelling it right now, like smell memory. But it was definitely a different time. It's like a dust smell? Hmm, it's very... Burning dust? No, no not at all. No? No. I don't, know what it, I don't know what it smells like. And that sound of the projector is really loud, especially when you're sitting right next to it like Sam was, and uh, your brain just tunes that out. Weird. I know, it's very odd. I feel like I've heard that sound fabricated as like... Oh, sure. You know, but the smell, they haven't designed smell of vision yet, so... It hasn't become popular yet. Do you imagine like the audio smell of vision podcast? Just audio <laughs> and smell. <laughs> what does this podcast smell like? Monster <laughs> energy drinks, coffee, and diet soda? Yeah. Yeah. Did you notice that Melvin's pants were a little too short in this episode? I did not. Melvin had some short pants. They were some high water pants with some white socks. Was that the thing back then? I don't know. I don't know. They've been very accurate about getting the costuming right. Oh, I'm sure it was a thing. It's bad when the bottoms of your pants like sway when you walk. They're so short that they they, they, like sway when you walk. I don't know. What I saw in the episode with what Sam was wearing was his pants seemed to be pulled up way too high. Maybe that's why they were so short on the bottom. (laughs) They seem to me like they were the pants that the actor playing Melvin, Marvin Burkett, was wearing. And Sam had to just pull them up higher because of the larger waistband. But like white socks. I totally saw his white I don't, socks. I don't know if they had... They, yeah, they had black dress socks back then. Well, I'm just saying like white socks are fine, but your pants shouldn't be three inches above the tops of your shoes. So the handling still sounds like a pterodactyl. <laughs> but, um, but in this episode, I like that he was like, and... Lyle becomes a divorce attorney. <laughs> like, <laughs> like there was such a suspense on what the next word was going to be. On the first viewing that I watched this with you, you were like, attorney. Like, you say it already. And then he said attorney. <laughs> like, you already knew the gag that was coming up the joke. Yeah, I was like, come on, really? You, you couldn't have put those two together? Do you really think the wives owned the men in the 50s? I feel like the men were still in control by that point. The 50s, the 90s, the noughties, the teens. I don't think, but it wasn't that like when the women's rights were going through because women didn't have any rights. So how could the women own the men? Again, in public, I think, yes. Men are tough, but most married men know the saying, happy wife, happy life. You can do whatever you want. Whether or not your wife's happy about it is another thing. Yeah, when your wife says to you, no, really, do whatever you want. It doesn't really mean that. No, that means do not under any circumstances do that. Don't So I don't think he meant owned, but definitely in a relationship, both partners have uh, equal say at least. (laughs) Don't agree. (laughs) Sure they do. For me, the ending of this episode came really quick. Like I was into the story. I was following the mystery. The shoe was going on, Hilla in the coffin, and we're at the end of the episode. Yeah, but he obsessed for a while. He did, but it was 45 minutes of lead up and then a minute and a half of ending. Yeah, I can kind of see that. It just came too quick for me. Maybe it was because I was enjoying the episode so much and enjoying the mystery so much, I wanted it to go longer. 
So we're going to wrap up for this episode of the Quantum Leap Podcast. <laughs> Until next time, I'm Albie. And I'm Heather. Oh, wait, no. No. <laughs> but that's what it felt like for me. <laughs> You're like, wow, this is really getting good. And it's over. We obviously don't have that problem if you listen to our last show. Yeah. Any more thoughts on Good Night, Dear Heart? I have not had a bad episode of Quantum Leap yet. I liked that they switched it up on this episode. I really did. Did it stand the test of time? Yeah, I think so. Because a lot of the problems that they face in this episode aren't resolved yet. Abortion is still pretty controversial. Homosexuality is still controversial in some people's minds. <laughs> well, both both topics are that's controversial nice, in some people's minds. <laughs> that's the nicest way to say that. Yeah, I mean, it's not as widely controversial as it once was, but I still think that... We're not perfect yet. I just wish we didn't. Like, I wish that it wouldn't be a, you're always going to have those people, you know? As a matter of fact, my last friend that I made a little bit over a year ago is a lesbian. I met her at work. She said she was gay. I said, cool. And that's the last time we really talked about it. But I don't think we're also not the people that our minds have to be changed. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, we already kind of already thought that way. Yeah, overall, I really enjoyed the episode. Yeah. And you even read a follow-up comic about it. so Which was pretty good. As promised earlier, we have an interview with Jennifer Runyon, who plays, as of yet, my favorite character on Quantum Leap, Peg Shratton. Yay. Jennifer Runyon played Peg Stratton in the pilot movie for Quantum Leap, Genesis. She's also known for guest appearances and characters in various sitcoms and dramas, as well as a couple of made-for-TV movies. Among her roles are Sally Frame on Another World, Gwendolyn Pierce on Charles in Charge, and replacing Susan Olsen as Cindy Brady in A Very Brady Christmas. Jennifer Runyon also appeared in Ghostbusters alongside Bill Murray in 1984, and was the female lead in the comedy Up the Creek. Now retired from acting, Jennifer lives in San Clemente, California with her husband and teenage daughter and remains passionate about self-expression through theater arts. Her acting skills, coupled with a knack for teaching, contribute to her role as an improv instructor and in-class creative projects director. How are you doing today? I'm well, thank you. It's so nice to talk to you. Oh, Albie, thank you for having me. I'm, I, I was very um, very touched you guys uh, wanted the interview. I, I, I love it. To us, you are a very big part of Quantum Leap because you're the first leading lady in the first episode of Quantum Leap, and a lot of people say it's the best episode. Wow. Oh, that's, that's so cool to hear. That's really neat. On our show, we usually compare the leading lady of the week to you. <laughs> You've been winning so far. Oh! <laughs> Oh, that's so cool. That's nice to know. I love that. Can you tell me a little bit about your experience filming Quantum Leap? Yeah. I, I, of course, I got the call to go in and audition for it and didn't read the script. You know, they didn't give me a script for it. They just gave me, um, you know, a couple scenes to go in and read for. And, and I did. And then they basically, it was a couple weeks worth of going back and forth. It probably, there was probably several of us that, you know, were up for it. And I did eventually get it, and then finally read the script and was just blown away. Because I really didn't have a whole grasp of exactly what it was about. I, I kind of knew. But once I read the whole script, I mean, it was just, it was, I just loved it. I thought this is going to be such a great, such a great show. Did you at the time know if it was going to be a series or is just maybe just another pilot? Yeah, it, it was a pilot. And I knew it was just a guest spot on the pilot. Yeah, so, you know, you never know if these things are going to get picked up, but you just had a feeling about Quantum Leap. I mean, once you read the script, and it was just so clever, and and then even more working on it with these amazing actors, you know, you just knew. Everybody knew. It was the first episode, so was it chaotic, or did they have their stuff together right away? Well, from what I remember... Um, I think it was probably a little bit of a mixture of both. I think they had it all together pretty well, but I think being the pilot, they were really careful to make sure they got every shot they wanted and that it looked the way they wanted it to because you're also, you know, you're selling it to the network. So, you know, it was pretty intense. Um, you know, there was a lot of hard work and a lot of hours, and they were particular, and I, th I think it was run pretty well. 
Well, that's good. Yeah. How'd the director treat you, David Hemmings? Oh, he was great. He was great. He, um, I'd never worked with him before, but just kind and and very giving. You know, was really supportive and and treated all of us really well. What was it like working with Scott Bakula? Oh, uh, that that was a dream. I did not know Scott Bakula. I did not know who Scott Bakula was. I don't know why I didn't know that. <laughs> um, but uh, I think he'd done a lot of theater, from what I remember it, people telling me. And I just, I was crazy about him. Just the kindest, um, really giving actor. You know, he was really supportive of all of us and, and just just a really nice guy. I recognize you from many things, including Charles in Charge. Yeah, yeah. What was it like being part of that? Oh, that was that was fun. That that was an interesting experience because when I read for Charles in Charge, I was just supposed to be a guest for the pilot. Um, it wasn't a series regular, so you know I just came in going, "Okay, this is cute. I, I love this show. This would this would be a great show to be on," and I love Scott and Willie. And the family, I mean, everybody was really great. And it was just a lot of fun. And when it was over, it was horribly sad because, you know, it's been such a great experience. And I think it was the first, might have been the first sitcom I did. I'd never, you know, done a um, multi-cam show before. So I was really surprised and so happy to get a call that they wanted me as a regular when the show got picked up. And um, and I, it was just the greatest experience. I learned so much from Scott and Willie. You know, they were veterans at comedy, and, you know, they were just terrific. You know, they were like my brothers. And, um, you know, I'm still, like, Willie Ames is my best friend to this day. And um, I just, it's a, it's a great memory. I loved, I loved Charles in Charge. Was it crazy having uh, millions of teenage boys having a crush on you? <laughs> Including I, myself. Oh, Albie, you're so nice. I have to be honest with you. I think I was clueless. Really? I had no idea. No, I had no idea. Um, I really, I just never imagined. You know, it, the show was only on one year, too. So I guess I just didn't. You know, you, you think, oh, the show's canceled. I never have ever walked around thinking anybody knows who I am. Um, so when they do, I'm really kind of shocked and I'm touched because um, I just, I don't know. I just, I've always been very shy and, and kind of quiet. So I'm always surprised when people remember. Who do you get recognized for the most? Gwendolyn Pierce. Gwendolyn Pierce and actually Ghostbusters. Do you do some conventions, right? You know what? I've done it. I've only done two. I haven't done one in years. So that was the first time, Albie, that I I realized um, that people remembered me. This agent kept calling me and, and saying, hey, we want you to do this convention. You've got so many fans. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding me? I have been out of this business for so many years. I've been raising my kids. I I left California for a while. I was living in Idaho. Um, I just, I couldn't even imagine. I just thought occasionally I'd get recognized, you know, but it was a really sweet, it was sweet, you know, I would, I'd be so touched. Well, he, he broke me down. He said, just, just do it. Just come and see. You will see. And I'm like, are you really, are you serious? And I thought, okay, I'm going to go. And of course I'm sweating thinking, Oh my God, nobody's going to come up to my table. Never. You know, I did, well, I guess I did do a lot of work, but I just never, I never thought anybody would remember everything. But it was, it was dear. I mean, people were coming in with quantum leap posters or, you know, Ghostbusters things that people, most of the cast had signed and they were so happy to see me because I was one of the last autographs to get on the on the poster and you know it, it just touches you you know it was really it was fun I, I I don't like to do them all the time because I it's a lot of um it's a lot of work and and I don't know it's just yeah is that why you retired to raise your children I did I did um I I always knew that um when I took on the responsibility to have children 
that I would for sure make that my priority because, um, you know, I had parents in the business. You know, my, my parents were in radio, and um, and I had a nanny till I was like seven years old when my mom finally retired and decided to stay home. So I didn't grow up in my early years with my mom. So I wanted that for my future children. I wanted to be the one, you know, to read them a book every night when they went to bed and watch them take their first steps, you know. I just I just thought that was my what I should be doing. Yeah, that's the most important. That's what life's all about. Yeah, I think so too. So you weren't actually pregnant in Quantum Leap? No. <laughs> they did a good job. You did a good job. Did that prepare you in any way for actually being pregnant? <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, it was really horrible what? is I put that, that contraption on and I swear to God, I had every freaking craving you could ever <laughs> imagine. And I ate. And I started laughing when the show was done. I'm like, I came like four or five pounds. I'm like, okay, this is scary. What's going to happen to me when I have a baby? <laughs> a real baby. <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was pretty interesting. It was kind of fun. You know, it was something I always wanted, you know, because I always wanted to have kids. So I had fun with that. A couple other things I really enjoyed you in. Uh, one of them, my dad was really into racing when I was a younger kid, and he always used to watch Six Pack. This is, it's very funny because everybody thinks I was in the movie with um, Kenny Rogers. That was Diane Lane. What I did, um, I did the pilot for a TV series, and I did it with Don Johnson, and um, Marky Post was in it. And ah. Yeah, it was really interesting. And um, an actor by the name of um, Billy Warlock played the oldest brother, and I was the oldest, I think, or he was. I, don't, I can't remember, but I played Diane Lane's part. And then there was another actor, a, the, one of the younger children, who his name was um, Lee Phoenix, who actually, his name, actual real name is Joaquin Phoenix. And uh, Joaquin, when he was little, um, his mom told me this story. And all, the whole family, by the way, was on the shoot, river and everybody. And uh, his mom said, yeah, he, he doesn't like his name. His name is Joaquin, but he wants a name like his brother and sister, so he's named himself Leaf. So if you ever can find a copy of Six Pack, the, the movie for TV, I think it did show once. I think it did show once. You'll see little Joaquin Phoenix in it. He was adorable. It might be out there somewhere. I'll check that out. Oh, I want to find that. I would <laughs> love a copy of that. Something I really enjoyed you in was Tag Team. Oh, my God. Because I'm, I'm into professional wrestling. I'm an independent professional wrestling uh, referee. So that was one of my things I used to watch all the time. Oh, that is so awesome. I love that you did that. That was a really fun movie. I, uh, or I think I did the movie. Did I just do one episode of the pilot? I can't even remember. I think there was only a pilot, as far as I yeah, remember. I think, yeah, I think it was just the pilot, right? And it never, it never got picked up. But uh, Roddy Piper was great. Jesse was great. They were really fun to work with. It was I had a lot of fun on that show. I actually saw um, Roddy all these years later. The second convention I ever did, which was about three years ago, and Roddy was there, and so it was really fun to reconnect with him. And I I walked up and like, do you remember me? And he goes, Oh my God, tag team! So I, I thought that was really nice that he remembered. That was great. Yeah, I wish that had gone to series. That would have been great. I think that would have been fun. <laughs> yeah, that would have. On your shoot for Quantum Leap, did you have a good time working with the other two ladies? Yeah, Leela Ivy and Lydia Cornell, I adored them. I adored them. We, um, I'm, I'm still friends with Lydia to this day. Um, just great girls, really great girls. We had a lot of fun. We were all pregnant together. And <laughs> and with our crazy hairdos, and we had a lot of fun in that movie. And you know, we we be we were on location some of the time, so you know, it was just it was fun hanging with them. They were great. Do you have any funny stories or anything uh, that you can share with us that happened on the set that people might not know about? That was so long ago, Alvy. Yeah, like twenty five years. It's crazy, oh, right? Oh my gosh, it was. It's like isn't that funny? You know, I think, I think, I, I can't pinpoint really a, a funny story. Um, I think maybe if I shared anything, it'd be just, just how great Dean Stockwell was. And, you know, these guys were just so amazing and fun. And, 
you know, treated all of us who, you know, we're we're just guest actors for the pilot, but treated us like we were part of the whole cast, you know, that we're, like we were coming back. It was just a great, great time. I really enjoyed it. I had a, I had a lot of fun doing it, and I used to go back. It's very, this is a cute story. I had so much fun. I got so close to everybody on that show that I used to go back and visit all the time. Like, I'd come back and have lunch with everybody. They would shoot at Universal, and, and I'd go back and see them. And, you know, come next week. Can you come next week? We'll be here. So I had, it was just a great family um, atmosphere on that show. One thing uh, me and my co-host Heather mm-hmm. picked up on when we watched this episode repeatedly before we did the pilot for our show was yeah. the chemistry that you had with Scott Bakula. Was that a real chemistry, or are you two just that good of actors? <laughs> I hope I'm that good of an actor, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? Um, he's not hard to 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 love on. Let me tell you, <laughs> he's such a sweetheart that, and he's he was so easy to act with. It was like a no brainer, and oh, I just loved it. I think that was one of my first um, first things I did where. You know, I wasn't the teenager anymore. I wasn't, I wasn't um, the girl next door anymore. You know, I was playing a wife <laughs> and a pregnant one and a grown up. And um, you know, three weeks before I shot the pilot, I was playing a seventeen year old. So it was really fun for me because I cut. I kind of got to be a grown up, you know, and a mom, and it was fun. I loved him. He was a doll. I, I I think it was probably one of the saddest uh, goodbyes for me because I, you know, it, that's the show you wish you, you had a regular job on. Mm. How was the kiss? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were the first to kiss him on Quantum Leap. I was. I was. I was. I, I I'll never forget a sitting sitting in this car, driving, pretending we're shooting, or pretending like we're driving, and we're actually on a soundstage, and we're doing this thing where I'm all cuddled up with them, and, and we're supposed to be seeing the, the signs for the Burma shave go by as we're driving, and, and, and I'm like, okay, what the hell is Burma shave? <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, yeah, they used to do this. He goes, yeah, they used to have this, you know, where they'd have these billboards, but it was really, you know, he was just easy, easy guy to get along with and really great guy. Was there a lot of rehearsal? Yeah, you know what, they, 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 like I said earlier, they, they really, um, they were really particular. They wanted it to look a certain way. Um, it was their pilot, so they're doing a lot of takes and making sure everything looks good. And yeah, it was, it was a lot, it, believe me, it was, it was a lot of hard work on that show, but it was fun hard work. Do you remember doing the uh, mirror shots? Yes. Uh, was that difficult to uh, get was, all four actors to be synchronized? It was really, yes, that was very, I remember that was really tedious. And, you know, you're also on a soundstage and, and you know, it's hot and, and, and it's not comfortable and, you know, but everybody was really professional and, and you know, we got it. But, yeah, the, that's the kind of stuff, that technical stuff like that was the, was pretty tedious to get it right. So you were in 18 again? I was. I was. Did you get to work much with George Burns? I did. Um, I did, like, I believe two scenes with George. Um, um, I did one, one scene where um, he has a dream, I think, Charlie has a dream, but it's actually that he's coming to my house for dinner to meet my family, and it's actually George Burns like in the dream. And so it, that was probably, that was such a great day. I mean, how, I mean, I used to watch, you know, I think Nick at Night used to play all the old 50s shows, and I used to watch the George Burns and Gracie Allen show all the time. Love that and, show. Oh, I used to love that, right? I mm-hmm. wish I wish there was a network on right now that, that played all those old shows from the 50s. Yeah. I Married Joan and oh, all that. those, right? Mm-hmm. I know, me too. I watched and, everything on Nick at Night back then. Right? Me too. I loved it. And um, and I, I'm, I kept thinking, oh my God, there's this is George Burns. And he's 
as cute as ever and always with his cigar and and he has his assistant that carries around his his um his little you know director's chair with with a little ashtray attached <laughs> and his cigar is always lit <laughs> but he was really he was really nice he was really funny he constantly entertains you you know he's constantly going into those little song and you know things that he would do and oh he's just just such a nice guy it's kind of like when you know you've made it when you're doing a scene with George Burns, I think. Oh, oh. And then I think I gave him a kiss in the, my last scene, the other scene I did with him, and I thought, okay, that's, that's a moment. I am kissing George Burns. Pretty. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. You're involved in a charity called TLC? Yes, we're a nonprofit. TLC stands for Tilly's Life Center, and... Um, in the States, it's, uh, it's a pretty popular store called Tilly's, and they sell all kinds of cool stuff. It's like a teen store. You know, lots of kids, it's, you know, love to shop there. And Tilly Levine is a friend of mine, and she wanted to give back. She wanted to work with teens and bring some guidance. You know, a lot of, a lot of kids out there just have nowhere to go, no one to talk to, not, not sure about their self-esteem and and, you know, we just want to enlighten them and, and give them tools to work with through hard times. And, and TLC has been great. I mean, we've had so much success. We're growing. We are now in high schools here in Southern California, which is pretty amazing. And uh, it's been a great experience. We've seen kids who just have gone through just the worst things you can imagine who walk in like, why am I here? Why am I doing this? And by the time they leave, they're kind of happy. You know, they've, they've, it's, it's, it's really made a difference, and um, I'm really proud of, of being a part of it. Is there any way people can find out more about it or help out in any way? Oh, that'd be great. If you um, go on uh, your computer and type in www.tillieslifecenter.org, and you will see um, what our program's about and um, any information you need. Cool. Very cool. That's nice that you do that. I love it. Also, uh, you do radio shows. This is what I'm interested in, too. Uh Yeah, I do. I do. Um, I do a radio show called Feast on This with uh, my co-host is uh, Venus Quintana. She's in New York and I'm in California. And it's pretty interesting. We've had a lot of fun. We interview a lot of chefs and restaurant owners and you know sometimes we just talk to each other about recipes and you know we do all kinds of you know, any any subject on health and, and food. You know, it could be, you know, the best sushi bar in New York or the best Mexican restaurant here in Southern California in my area. And then we'll have chefs on from different restaurants that we frequent or we've had some great chefs on from, you know, Top Chef and Chops. You know, we've had some, some of the guys who've done those shows. So it's been really fun. And um, the producer of that show... Um, wanted me to do another one and I said well I would do it but I don't want to I, I, I want to have it be like a um, ensemble because I don't want to be it to be just me <laughs> I, would, I don't think I would do very well so um, I got my friend Willie Ames um, from 8 is Enough, Charles in Charge and my friend Susan Olson who was Cindy Brady and uh, I, and actually, I'm fake Cindy. I'm Christmas Cindy. From the yeah. uh, very Brady Christmas, right? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I remember at the time being conflicted because I liked you, but I was upset that they recast her. Yes, yes. And I was very nervous about that because I was so honored to be asked to do it. Um, and she was on her honeymoon, but actually, fake story, She they actually just didn't want to pay her what they were going to pay everyone else, which <laughs> is horrible, but that's and not sad. what they told me. Yeah, it's really horrible. Um, but anyway, I, I went in and did it and, and I had worked with Christopher Knight before. Christopher Knight had played my boyfriend on a soap opera I did years before. So oh, wow. I thought, okay, I know Chris, I know Chris, you know, and now I'm going to be a sister, not his girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is kind of funny, but uh, I did, I did the Brady Bunch and it was great. I had such a fun time. Um, they welcomed me with open arms and, um, it was a great experience and Susan, Years later, now I'm I'm married and I have children, um, little little kids, and I go into a Burger King with my sister-in-law and her kids and my kids, and there's Susan Elson with her son, and I'm like, oh my god, it's Susan, 
I've never met her. By, by the way, I've never met her. So I'm like, I have to say something. I have to go up to her. We're forever connected. I have to, you know, introduce myself. So I did. I went up and I said, Susan, you don't know me, but she goes, you're Jennifer. <laughs> and um, she was a doll. She was just such a sweetheart, gracious, and and I just said, I hope I did you proud. And, you know, it, it, we were still we're friends to this day. So now we do this radio show, Willie, Susan, and I, and it's called Fluid. And uh, it's a podcast on Blog Talk Radio, WBAR New York. And we're on every Tuesday night from 7 to 8. And we're on iTunes. So if anybody wants to check us out, and it's been a it's been a great time. It's a it's a fun show. It's you know every once in a while we get a little serious, but we really try to just have fun. No matter what the subject is, I think I would listen to that just because it had the three of you on it. it oh my gosh, you have gotta listen, Albie. <laughs> you know what? You've gotta listen and let me know what you think. Okay, I, I'm a I podcast love... junkie, so I will listen. Oh my god. Okay, you've gotta check it out because I want to see what you think. Okay, I will. Okay, cool. I have some silly questions uh, okay. about quantum leap in the pilot episode genesis sure. in that episode you were wearing clip-on earrings this is a silly okay. question okay yes okay we noticed that a lot in the episodes of quantum leap since they've been redone in high def that you can tell that a lot of the ladies have clip-on earrings was that yeah do you have pierced ears or was that a it's costume true. designer thing no that's i have pierced ears that was just what they did in that era and they were very um particular about whatever era I mean this is at least with my pilot episode they were very particular about being authentic and I would assume that they did that with each episode wherever whatever era they were in I think that's fun for the you know the set decorators and the wardrobe people you know and the makeup people it was a really creative show I would think for them as well Take me back a little bit to where um, you were in the kitchen and uh, the walls were rumbling. And at one point, the uh, washing machine was moving and you kicked it back. Yeah. What did it take and how many people did it take to accomplish all that? (laughs) Oh, you're bringing back so many memories. Um, You know, it was like a ballet, you know, it was like a dance. Okay, I had to um, know that at this moment, this was going to happen. And then at that moment, that was going to happen. So it was choreographed. And it took, it, you know, it took a, quite a while to get it down. And not just, not because I made a mistake necessarily, but, you know, the washing machine didn't bounce over fast enough. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it, so it, it, was, it was like a dance. It was really interesting. There's a silly line that stands out to us uh, when we watch Genesis, and okay. it's it's the one you have about how Tom hasn't hung out with Mikey this oh, much since he was hit I by the bus. What <laughs> yeah, what is that, and where did it come from, know. and how does that fit in? Did you question I it at the time know. when you guys were doing it? or We all laughed. I'm like, okay, wait, Mikey got hit by a bus? <laughs> and they're like, yeah. And I'm like... But I think the whole point of it was because I, I this is how I took it. Okay. Um, there was an accident. Mikey got hit by the bus, and it's supposed to shock Scott. Like, what? Yeah. You know. What? So, and I had to just say it like so, like matter of fact, like you know, in my moment of you're never here, you know. <laughs> but I thought that was such a funny line. I know. Yeah. And it never was elaborated on, you know. We never talked about Mikey's bus accident again. <laughs> and the uh, the actor didn't even have a limp or anything? No. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. That was I great. Know. Maybe he just fell out the door. <laughs> hey, yeah, there you and, go. You know, I don't know. Well, maybe, you know, well, no, he got hit. Hit by a bus, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I always wondered about that, too. (laughs) Uh, Our theory was that just uh, somebody had wanted to write that into a script somewhere, and that's where they Yeah, and you may be right. (laughs) You may be right about that. Is there anything else you might want to talk about or have any other memories that we could talk about before we go? Um, Gosh, I mean, you know, listen, it it was just a wonderful experience, and when I look back on it, it was just such fond memories, and... I was looking through my scripts um, while I was cleaning out a, a cabinet in my garage the other day, and, and I found all these old scripts, and, and to find that one was really cool. And it just 
brought back so many memories. And, you know, I met a lot of nice people. I, you know, I met Lydia, Scott, Dean, um, you know, all of them, just Leela Ivy. I mean, just great, great people. And, um, you know, I, I was really fortunate and I think I was really lucky and um, blessed to have gotten the part because it's nice to be a part of um, of history like that, you know. I mean, it's people love this show, and um, I'm really honored that I got to be in the pilot. That is so cool that you got to interview her. She seems like such a nice person. Like she was genuinely interested in what you had to say. That's awesome. She was really nice and it was awesome talking to her. If uh, I could have told my teenage self that one day I would be talking to the actors who played Gwendolyn Pierce, I wouldn't have believed me. (laughs) You're just so cool. But it was cool to get those insights. And uh, I think now we know a little bit more about Genesis. I think it's starting to become a trend that everybody you interview is like, that was 25 years ago (laughs) and you're trying to ask me specific details. It is crazy, but you know, a lot of people remember some things. So the more people we interview, the more pieces of the puzzle we have and we can understand how it was. I don't remember 25 years ago. No, (laughs) you don't. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, that was really cool. I, she's still my favorite. I did listen to her shows, very good shows worth a listen to, and the links to those shows are in our show notes. Awesome. And now we have a segment from Jill Arroway. Good night, dear heart. A commentary by Jill Arroway, read by Tawny Fennerin. A while back, I told Heather and Albie that I'd like to write about one or two Quantum Leap episodes, say one or two per season. I didn't want to write about the big ones, though, episodes like The Leap Home. Those episodes are fantastic, of course, but they're going to be everyone's favorite. So I wanted to cover one or two of the more obscure ones. Mostly that means obscure, but brilliant, the lesser-known gems that appeal to me. But not this time. No, sad to say, I elected to write about Good Night, Dear Heart specifically because I have some bad things to say about it. Good Night, Dear Heart is unique among all Quantum Leap episodes in that it is the only story involving gay women. That should make it a good episode, right? After all, haven't we been hearing these last few months how great Quantum Leap has been at challenging prejudice? We've seen all sorts of prejudices covered in the episode so far, and the message has always been the correct one. Bigotry is wrong. But in this case, I believe the writers blew it big time. Let's go back in time a little bit. In the 1950s, the portrayal of lesbians in the media was almost non-existent. According to Wikipedia, lesbian characters made very rare appearances in radio programs, almost always as killers or murder victims. The first lesbian on American radio was in an episode of a crime series called The Black Museum, entitled The Brass Button. The character, Jeanette Morgan, is the episode's murder victim. She is described as not interested in men and living that strange and unnatural kind of way. Jeanette is murdered by a soldier who, having heard gossip about her, makes sexual advances. She rejects him. He strangles her to death. Well, that was in 1951. We would hope that things had moved on a little since then. In 1957, Sam Beckett arrives. He's leaped into a whodunit. Can he solve the murder? Well, of course he can, but here's my problem with this episode. There are two lesbian characters in this story. One, Stephanie, is the murderer. The other, Hilla, is the murder victim. And the motive? Oh dear, the motive. Well, see, it turns out that Hilla wasn't properly gay. She was just confused. At some point in her past, she had been raped by a man, and so naturally she became a lesbian. She was easy prey for Stephanie, who seduced her. But then along came the right man, And as we all know, all it takes to cure a lesbian is the right man. 
Greg was kind and gentle and didn't rape her, so naturally she realized that men weren't so bad after all. So she didn't have to make do with women anymore. Hooray for that! Unsurprisingly, Stephanie was none too happy about this development. So she got angry with Hilla, they had a row, and Stephanie killed her. Oh boy, what kind of message does any of that send to the world about gay people? There were some good things about the episode, I guess. Sam himself was never prejudiced in any way. He had a murder to solve. He pondered the clues. He figured it out. He treated everyone equally and fairly. I'm always a sucker for a good whodunit, and Sam figured it out before I did, so that's good. Good Night, Dear Heart won an Edgar Allan Poe Award for Best Episode in a TV Series. Those awards are presented every year by the Mystery Writers of America. They honor the best in mystery fiction. So it's a cracking whodunit, just with a 1950 stereotypical portrayal of gay women. It is possible to look at this episode in a more forgiving light. You could perhaps argue that Hilla was bisexual, and the whole rape thing was a non sequitur. I'm not convinced, though. If you'd wanted to write a decent gay or bi story, all you'd have to do was write about some gay or bisexual people in a positive, non-stereotypical way. The story may have been set in 1950s, but it was made in the 1990s. Wikipedia tells me that there was a sequel to this episode in the Quantum Leap comic book. The sequel was called Up Against a Stonewall and featured Stephanie, now out of jail, in the middle of the Stonewall riots. Anyone who knows anything about gay history will tell you that Stonewall was one of the most significant events ever for the gay rights movement. I haven't read the comic story, but I have to imagine that it's likely to be far superior to Goodnight, Dear Heart. At the very least, I hope it put right what once went wrong. I didn't come here to complain. I am a Quantum Leap fan, honestly, and normally if I don't like an episode, I keep my trap shut. But on this occasion, I couldn't hold it in. The next time I write about an episode, I promise I'll have nice things to say about it. It will be one of those hidden gems that I was talking about. I look forward to writing that one. I think we kind of touched on this earlier. It's hard not to in this episode. It's cool that we can all watch the same episode of Quantum Leap and see it it differently. I guess it really shows how watching a TV show can affect people differently and what they view. So that's cool. Yeah, I like your take on it. It's good to find out a little bit more about the history of lesbians in murder mysteries and such. Yeah, I didn't, I, I didn't know that. I guess I never thought about it. I'm sure uh, that influences her take on it. Probably. But yeah, I definitely had those feelings partway through my whole arc of understanding the episode. Maybe I'm just forcing myself to like it because I just like Quantum Leap. I don't know. And now we have a novel review by David Feldman, read by Albie. <laughs> Quantum Leap, The Wall, written by Ashley McConnell, published by Ace Books in 1994. The Wall is the third Quantum Leap novel, and the third one written by Ashley McConnell. Other than the mind-body inconsistency, which also marks her previous Quantum Leap novels, this story is top-notch. It's also significant for being one of the few stories in which Sam leaps outside the borders of the United States. It's 1961, and Sam has leapt into a little girl named Missy an American military brat, living with her dysfunctional family in Hainerberg, West Germany. What's especially troubling about this particular leap is that Sam is practically helpless to effect any change, stuck as he is in the body of a frail six-year-old. For most of the story, he must simply endure and react to situations as they happen and do his best not to make things worse. The Wall is arguably the first Quantum Leap novel to fall in the category of stories with a strong moral or lesson. Like some of the more popular episodes of the TV series, What Price Gloria and Jimmy, to name a few. 
The Wall touches on an important social issue and addresses it head-on. The issue here is child abuse and the long-term negative effects of corporal punishment on children. This is a sensitive subject for many people, especially for those who have grown up in abusive environments. But McConnell's novel handles it well. Without coming off as too dimensional or preachy, the story here is low-key, less focused on the adventure and suspense of many Quantum Leap plots, and more centered on the characters and the overall family dynamics in a nuclear family marked by stress, anxiety, tension, and emotional and physical trauma. For most of the novel, Sam is confined to the family apartment, struggling to deal with his alcoholic mother, stern and ever-absent father, and emotionally distant brother. The real fulcrum of the story comes later in the novel, when Sam leaps back into Missy 28 years after the original leap. This time, it's 1989, and the Berlin Wall is coming down, as is whatever remnants of the family structure still remains with Missy's family. Sam, inhabiting the body of a much older Missy, must help his younger brother overcome his denial about the past and avoid falling into the same cycle of abuse with his own children. The Wall may not be the most approachable Quantum Leap novel, but it's certainly one of the more relevant titles in the Quantum Leap library. It sheds light on a problem that still persists in modern times, the harsh cycle of child abuse and its tendency to pass from one generation to the next. It's a very worthwhile read. Look for a copy at a used bookstore near you. Yeah, I'd like to read that one. She leaps into 1989. That's kind of popular lately, 1989. A little bit Taylor Swift. A little bit your birthday. I know, weird, right? Right? You're the same age as Taylor Swift. I don't know if that's good or bad. I don't mind it. (laughs) And now we have feedback. And these emails will be read by Juan. This episode starts with Sam getting worked over in a place where the sheriff apparently has it in for him. Naturally, Sam fights back for a moment, but that doesn't work out very well. It turns out he looks like an Indian, which made me wonder if this was going to be like Billy Jack, with Sam doing a lot of fighting with bigots. Apparently not. The way this show went made me highly uncomfortable with them stealing the truck, stealing from the store, and stealing horses. It's almost as if the writer was trying to present Indians in a sympathetic light while perpetuating a stereotype of them stealing what they want. There were a couple of cool moments, like when the grandfather was sitting by the fire and discussing his view of the circle of life, which can be applicable to what Sam is doing, leaping from life to life. I appreciate that a person has the right to die, and that the grandfather has a desire to not die surrounded by walls, but why did we have to get to the reservation? Wasn't it good enough to be out in the open? Oh well, it was okay, but not one I would look forward to in the rewatch. Next time, if I'm lying, I'm dying. No, wait, next time. I think it's a locket. Or is it? Next time, swinging free. Whichever it is, I'll be there. Father Beast. So not one of Father Beast's favorites. No. Which is understandable. Yeah, that was kind of weird how they kind of made them stereotypical Indians. Yeah, probably the writing of the time. Oh, yeah, probably. I don't think they would be like that now. But I think they were doing the best they could at the time with their level of understanding, maybe. It could have been better, definitely. I like that he comments, next time, if I'm lying, I'm dying. No, wait, next time, I think it's a locket. Or is it, next time, swinging free. And now we have an email from Aaron Moss. Great news, for me at least. Finally all caught up on your great podcast. Here's the last of my notes from your episodes. My future emails probably won't be so long-winded now that I'm listening to you in real time. Episode 19. Troyan's husband might have bumped his head on the boat or something else and knocked him out or loopy and caused him to drown. I didn't realize that Deborah Pratt was Troyan in this episode. Heather said she couldn't change her voice. Let someone punch her in the gut and see if she can change her voice. I think the reason they have the leap in at the end of the episode is like leaving every episode on a cliffhanger and giving you a slight preview of the next show, a reason to come back. I agree that they should correct it when they release it on Blu-ray and also add the original music back. I agree with Albie that they should fix the leap out slash in so it matches up with the next episode on the DVD slash Blu-ray, but again... I'm older and a longtime fan of Quantum Leap, much like Albie. Episode 20. I think Newt breaking his neck was possibly in a second timeline, after Sam changed the future by stopping the bomb from blowing up the building. 
The first timeline, the building blew up and it interrupted the luau, so Newt didn't jump and break his neck. After Sam stopped the building from blowing, a second timeline had Newt jumping and breaking his neck. Then the final timeline is what we saw. Great interview with Ducky. You really need to give Hayden's section a name. How about Leaping with Hayden or Hayden's Thoughts? Just a thought. As far as inconsistency with Sam's college career, it's been a while since I've seen the series so I could be mistaken, but maybe he was in college at 16, graduated, and then at 17 he was in between his majors. Or, theory B, I'm at work so I can't check the timeline or anything, but maybe he was in college at 16, started at 14 or 15 like Doogie, took time off when he was 17 due to the death of his brother, and then went back. I don't know if that's good enough for a no prize, but those are two working theories. I'm sure Hayden or someone will prove them wrong. Episode 21. Sam is a man, so when his shirt was ripped open, he didn't think of boobs hanging out. Hmm, boobs hanging out. As to Spielberg killing dinosaurs, do you have any proof that Spielberg wasn't killing dinosaurs? As to 30-year-old high schoolers, I think that they get older people to play high schoolers, especially for TV shows, as when you're a teenager, you're changing more and growing. While adults have finished growing for the most part, and it's easier to keep continuity or to do reshoots when your actor isn't changing overnight. Hope that makes sense. I think that the abundance of tumbleweeds in this episode was to highlight that it took place in Arizona. Could be wrong. I really enjoyed the segue to Hayden segment. Made me chuckle. Episode 22. Burger Effect. Star Wars in both episodes. Life on Mars. If my memory serves, the actual endings to the UK and the American version were vastly different. The UK was the better ending in my opinion. I agree that if I didn't know the ending, I could use the similarities between the UK, LOM, and Quantum Leap. Al revisiting little Teresa. If Al can go anywhere in the time frame that Sam is, if Sam leaps back into the 80s after 81, could he conceivably go visit young Teresa while Sam is doing what he does? Granted, no guarantee that Sam will leap to a time closer to us than 81, but that's one possibility. Just food for thought. Episode 23. I also like when Sam deals with things from his own life slash timeline, and I too wish that the professor would have shown up again. I enjoyed the commentary on the episode entitled Boogie Boogie Sorry, my computer's having problems. Anyways, that episode. Have you heard slash seen the Quantum Leap fan movie, Quantum Leap, A Leap to Die? It looks like Deborah was involved with it. Haven't watched it yet. Anywho, sorry for the long email, but at least I'm caught up. Also, regarding the release of the entire season of Quantum Leap on DVD, I don't have the money to pay for multiple copies of movies, especially a TV series. I'm going to wait and hope they release it on Blu-ray with the correct leap outs and the correct music. Maybe you guys could get a letter writing campaign going or a petition. If I had the extra money, I'd buy the entire DVD series. But since funds are at a limit, I need to watch what I spend it on. Finally, I've played your promo on my fourth episode of my podcast, Head Speaks, and hopefully I'll be recording my fourth Task Force X podcast, and I'll include it in there also. Everyone needs to be listening to this fantastic podcast. Anyways, for the final time this email, thanks again for the great podcast, and keep them coming. Aaron, Brotherhead, Moss. I always look forward to his emails. I'm kind of sad that they're going to be in real time now. <laughs> We're going to go through Aaron, Brotherhead, Moss email withdrawals. <laughs> You're just going to have to write us really long emails about each episode. <laughs> Um, so much in that email made me smile and chuckle. Yeah, I agreed with a lot of what he said. And a lot of it made sense, like the high schoolers not changing overnight. That is awesome because it does take a long time to record something and they could change overnight. So that makes a lot of sense. And uh, the alternate timeline created by the bomb and how it would affect Newt. So that makes sense. I like to think with all of our listeners that send us feedback and us and our crew all together, we're almost like a quantum leap think tank. And uh, I think we're going to get this whole thing figured out eventually. I love hearing other theories, especially like going back like that. It's, it's really cool. At least we know it's just not you and me talking to each other in a studio, that it's actually going out there somewhere. And I like that he is noticing that Hayden just proves us wrong all the time. <laughs> Haydenpedia. <laughs> Maybe that's what his segment should be called. <laughs> Maybe. We're still thinking of names, so we'll try it out and see what we get. We have another email from Aaron. Well, Heather asked me for an email on every episode. Here you go. And when I said that since I'm caught up, it'd probably be shorter emails, apparently I was wrong. You guys made a comment that even though Joseph was a thief and a racist, you still liked him. I have the exact opposite feeling. He may have been charismatic as heck, but it still doesn't make him any less of a thief or a racist. In fact, the fact he tries excusing his thefts with his race makes me dislike him even further. 
but I have been accused of suffering from old man disease. Get off my lawn, kids. If a white guy had said, at least you're not Native American, or at least you're not black, would that have been racist? If so, then Joseph Line was just as racist. Now, having said that, I did and still do think that it was a funny line, and I enjoyed it. Why should we celebrate Native American Day? Is that the term still politically correct, or is it now forbidden to use because someone doesn't like it? We're honoring Columbus on that day. The man that discovered what would become America. Discovered is in quotes, because if I remembered right, another man discovered it first. American Val Cruz or something or another. History class was so long ago for me. But Columbus gets the credit, so he gets the holiday. And yes, contrary to what some people say, he discovered the country. Even though people were living here, the other half of the world didn't know it was here, so they discovered it. If you can't use that word here, then you might as well throw it out as nothing is ever really discovered by that definition. And contrary to popular belief nowadays, Indians weren't a peaceful, fun-loving people. They lived in filth, they warred with each other, and were what we considered barbaric. While the white folk did bring more death and disease to this country, we also brought the country. Before white people settled here, what was this country called? From what I've heard, even from Indians, there wasn't a country, but a bunch of separate tribes and groups. My mind is blanking on the term I'm looking for. Do people still use Indian giver? I haven't heard that term in years. Wasn't sure it was still a thing until Heather mentioned it. Color me surprised. Like Albie, I too get a lot of my news from South Park. As far as assisted suicide and people that are in favor of it because they believe in something after this life waiting for them, I disagree to an extent. I used to be a Christian and believed in an afterlife. Since then, I have grown up, for lack of a better term, and realized that there may be nothing and probably is nothing out there after we die. But even having come to that realization, if I was constantly in pain or a burden to my family, I would rather let them pull the plug. I wouldn't want my family to suffer seeing me hooked to machines for 20 years and the cost of keeping me alive for years and not actually being there for my family. Now, I'm not saying a different opinion is wrong. That's just my opinion on the matter, and if you don't agree, you're wrong. I didn't realize or notice that Sam had put two handprints on his horse. Of course, it's probably been 15 to 20 years since I've seen the episode. Just a side note. 1122, 1977 is my wife's birthday, so I liked that date this episode. I wanted to second Skipper's comment about how good of a job you two are doing. As for the finale of Quantum Leap, I hated that it ended, but I love the ending episode and I have mixed feelings about the actual ending. While some of Skipper's explanation about the behind the scenes stuff works slash worked went a little above my head, not too much, but some, I did enjoy the interview and how he told us a lot of how the behind the scenes worked. I really enjoyed the Halloween episode and your commentary on it. As far as my original email to you, I'm pleasantly surprised that you read all of my emails and notes as there were so many of them. But I did enjoy it, as I enjoy hearing myself being mentioned on a podcast or anywhere. It's part of my, hey, look at me, look at me, complex my wife accuses me of having, which is probably why I'm doing two podcasts and thinking of starting a third. But enough of my egomania. Yeah, three and a half kids means that my wife is currently pregnant with my fourth child, a son named Grayson. Regarding laying the bricks in the back patio, I still have more to lay, so I have plenty of room for anyone that gets too curious. And when I referred to Voyager, that was a typo. I was actually referring to the TV show Voyagers from 82 to 83, another time travel show where someone is trying to set right what once went wrong. Here's a link if you're unfamiliar with it. en.wikipedia.org slash wiki slash voyagers exclamation point i seem to remember liking voyagers when i was 12 and yes heather i'm going through quantum leap podcast withdrawals i need to find time to pull my quantum leap discs and watch them again until next time aaron brotherhead moss wow that was a long one (laughs) but i did say that he should write them for every episode okay so as far as the look at me look at me complex i totally know someone like that Really? Who? You. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Look at what I'm doing over here. Look at me. Yeah. Look at me. And our daughter. Yeah, she How's got that, that from too? me. She got it's that hereditary, from me. apparently. I did get some feedback from listeners about the topic of uh, assisted suicide or euthanasia. And, uh, you know, it's a difficult topic. I respect everyone's opinion and experience and knowledge in the area. I have no experience or knowledge in the area. And I don't want any. Right. And uh, he says we're doing a good job. Thanks. Thank you very much. He liked the commentary. That's awesome. I haven't heard the commentary. You can't hear it yet, but soon, when we get there, Voyagers. I did love Voyagers when I was a kid, and I couldn't wait for it to come out on DVD, and when it did, I never bought it. 
I don't understand. I should have it, but I don't. Is it bad that I don't know what that is? It was before your time, literally. Maybe I'll have to go to that Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was a good show. It, a kid and a guy traveling through time. I think they had a stopwatch. All I remember was when it was on when I was a kid, I was really excited it was on and it was time travel. And that's about all I remember. Maybe there was a pirate ship. I'm not sure. Is it weird that there was a lot of time travel and space shows back in the 80s and 90s and now it's sitcoms and crime shows? There's time travel if you look for it. Is there any time travel TV shows on right now, though? Yeah, Doctor Who. Okay. That's a big time travel. But that's also been on since the 60s. <laughs> but so. there, there wasn't a lot competing with Quantum Leap. It seems to be like one series at a time. And Doctor Who's really good. So. Yeah, no, it's I'm, I'm okay with Doctor Who. We should have more episodes per season, but that's the only thing I can complain about. And we have some Facebook feedback. From Matthew Vandiver. I hope I said that right. I just discovered the podcast and I look forward to catching up on previous episodes and being there for the rest of the journey. Quantum Leap was a favorite from my younger days and remains a favorite with me still. Scott Bakula also remains one of my favorite actors of all time. Nice to have you on board, Matthew. We always get a lot of Facebook comments, but I like when we hear about new listeners, so that's why I included that one. We have some iTunes reviews. This is from Monkey Tuesday, and it's a five-star rating. A fun trip through Quantum Leap nostalgia. I have been really enjoying listening to this podcast as I have been a huge fan of Quantum Leap since I first discovered it in the early 90s. Albie and Heather have kept the podcast entertaining and informative. I really like the music segues into the different segments as it keeps Quantum Leap present in the background. The growing number of guest segments from listeners shows that Heather and Albie want to include additional perspectives and that is really cool. Hayden McQueenie gives us a lot of food for thought on each episode, which allows us to appreciate the series even more. I have also really enjoyed getting to know Heather and Albie as people, and it was a nice surprise to find out that they are actually a real-life couple. And best of all, I really like that we can live vicariously through Heather's experience of watching the series, as it is her first time traversing through the Quantum Leap universe. But before I conclude this review, I wish to acknowledge Albie's excellent interviewing skills when interviewing various individuals from the show. My one criticism about the podcast is that it doesn't have a set schedule of when it comes out and it usually feels like a long time between podcasts. But I am perhaps coming from a spoiled perspective and should just be grateful that there is a Quantum Leap podcast at all. I will go sit in the corner now. Smiley face. Your loyal listener, Brian. (laughs) That's a good review. Yeah, that's. uh, I think that's the one bad thing about us is we're not as frequent as we would like to be. It's not for lack of trying. No. Um, (laughs) But the way I'm looking at it is it is a time travel show and it is an evergreen podcast. So 20 years from now, people can listen to the Quantum Leap podcast and... And they won't know that we skipped a couple weeks. (laughs) Right. So we're we're actually not doing it for us right now. We're doing it for people in the future. And to them, they downloaded them all at once. So well, they have no problem with us back now then. But we hope to try better. Oh, yeah. We're, better. we're always trying. But I really like that he likes the show. This is by Brotherhead, which is probably Aaron Moss. This is a five-star rating. I was in my late teens, early adulthood, when this show was on. I loved this show. Quantum Leap was fantastic. I loved it. Heather and Albie's review of the show is just as fantastic. I love listening to Heather's first-time viewer thoughts on it, and I really enjoy Albie's longtime fan comments. Ignore the one Yahoo up top complaining about Al and Heather's nitpicks. Yes, they're going to pick at nits, as this show is so fantastic that's the only thing you can do. To be fair, you want to point out the flaws. Most of the flaws in this show are little nitpicks, so please, Albie and Heather, keep it up. As long as you keep reviewing, I'll keep listening. Anyone looking for a great Quantum Leap podcast should be listening to this one. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Brotherhead. Yeah, we pick at the nits out of love. Yes. Because, like you said, that's all there is. It's a pretty good series overall. Yeah. And most of them are just like silly 80s and 90s things. Did you see that guy's elbow? (laughs) And this is from Light46403. A blast from the past. It's another five-star rating. This is a great podcast dealing with the show Quantum Leap. It is very enjoyable, and I love hearing the views of one who has watched the show before and a newbie. I can't wait for the next episode. Well... Congratulations, the next episode is out as you're listening to this. Ha ha ha. ha. <laughs> and that's our iTunes reviews. Please, please, if you like what we do and you want other people to know about it, go on iTunes and give us a five star review and tell people why you like it. And because we'll read it on the show. And that's just awesome. There are many ways, many, to send feedback to the Quantum Leap podcast. 
you can email us at quantumleappodcast at gmail.com. You can go to our website, quantumleappodcast.com. Join us on Facebook at facebook.com slash quantumleappodcast. We are on Twitter at quantumleappod. We are also on Instagram posting lots of quantum leapy photos. And liking quantum leapy photos. And that username is at quantum leap podcast. And you can also call us and leave a voicemail, which would be so cool. Don't be shy. No one will pick up. It's a computer. Yeah. So you can just call and leave a voicemail and we will put it on our show. And that number is 707-847-6682. So please contact us in one of the many ways or multiple ways. And let us know what you think of this episode or any other episodes that you've listened to recently. And we will definitely feature you on the show if you want to be featured. If not, just let us know. But we still want to hear from you. We want all opinions. Yes. Whether they mirror ours or not. Right. (laughs) Whether they sync up in the mirror or not. (laughs) And uh, another link I'd like to remind you about is quantumleappodcast.com slash Amazon. Especially during this holiday season. Exactly. People are going to spend tons of money and... I don't know about you, but I do a lot of my shopping on Amazon because they have really great stuff. And and you don't have to leave the house. Yeah. And you ever go to a store and you're looking for something and they don't have it. And then you go to another store and you're looking for something and they don't have it. And then you go on Amazon and they have it. <laughs> right. So I just stop going to the stores and I just go to Amazon. But if you're going to do shopping on Amazon, help out the show and it doesn't cost you anything extra. You just go to quantumleappodcast.com slash Amazon. That'll kick you over to the real Amazon, but we'll get credit for everything you buy while you're there. And it doesn't cost you anything extra. They just kick back, I think it's 4% right now for us, which isn't a lot, but it'll help out the show. Yeah. If you can remember, quantumleappodcast.com slash Amazon. For all your holiday shopping. You can buy anything. You can buy... Groceries. You can buy Quantum Leap on DVD. You can buy groceries. You can buy air filters for your air conditioner. You can buy auto parts. What are some things I bought lately? Reaction figures. Those are pretty cool. Yeah. A Back to the Future t-shirt. I got a Bluetooth thing that I hooked up to my old record player from the 70s. So now my record player is now Bluetooth and I got that on Amazon. Just in case you want to turn your record player into a Bluetooth player. Well, it's just so I can listen to the podcast on it. Wow. How fancy of you. So make sure to do all your holiday shopping at quantumleappodcast.com slash Amazon. We are on Patreon. You can find us at patreon.com slash quantumleappodcast. And uh, we'd like to thank our patrons. Tom Quinn, Donald Summerlin, and our new patron, Jason Ritter. Yay. Thank you, Tom, Donald, and Jason. We really appreciate that you are uh, helping out the show and you believe in us. And if you want to find us on Patreon, that URL is patreon.com slash quantumleappodcast. P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And now, I've come up with a name for Hayden's segment. Okay. (laughs) Hayden talks about the Quantum Leap comic, Up Against the Stone Wall. So if you haven't read that comic yet, you might want to skip this segment. Okay, we're going to try this one. Hanging with Hayden. What do you think of the new name for your segment, Hayden? Hey, Leapers. This is Hayden. And I need this segment like I need a heel in the head. Good Night, Dear Heart as a story. It's a gripping mystery, again with plenty of suspects, well-thought-out clues, and a gripping reveal. It's also nice that for once, the redhead was not the red herring. I thought that the use of the high heel as the murder weapon was brilliant. What really makes this episode great is the acting by both the main cast and the guest cast, which was gripping. Al's fear of anything that's dead is hilarious and Scott Bakula's portrayal of Sam's obsession with Hilla is haunting. I don't exactly know what Sam's motivation was which caused this obsession. Was it just the fact that he believed if he didn't put right the wrong, then he couldn't leap? Or did he feel a real connection to Hilla? Maybe our listeners could uh, post their thoughts. Another stroke of brilliance in the writing is to have a character who is gay, but not portrayed as evil or a freak or anything that's out of the ordinary for the majority of the episode, aside from being a killer, of course. 
but it was clear that Stephanie didn't kill Hiller just because she was gay. She killed Hiller because she lost control after losing the love of her life, a clear crime of passion, which could just as easily have been a male character to do the same thing. I don't know if Stephanie was in the closet or had come out, but I'm leaning more towards her being open about her sexuality as she was the one who wanted the relationship and wasn't ashamed of it, while it was Hiller who was unsure of her feelings. Quantum Leap was well ahead of its time. I can't think of another show from that time or before which had a character as an upstanding member of society whose sexuality was not considered to be anybody's business except that person's. And that's the viewpoint that the vast majority of society has now. I am a little disappointed that it did end up being Stephanie who was the killer, though, as it would be easy, at least at the time, to associate the fact she was a killer with her being homosexual. It's not a true representation of the LGBT community. If I'd written this episode, I would have either had Hilla be killed by Roger after she tried to leave him to be with Stephanie, and this could be a chance to bring in violence against women issues to be discussed in the episode as well, or to have Hilla go through with the abortion and have her die from a complication, and then her being in the river being a cover-up. One issue that I want to bring up, though is that as brilliant as the writing of this episode is, it does not feel like an episode of Quantum Leap. Goodnight, Dear Heart would have been a brilliant episode of Law and Order or NCIS, for example. The entire premise of Quantum Leap is to put right what once went wrong. Surely Sam should have leapt to stop Hiller from being killed, rather than just to figure out who had killed her so that she could get some justice. This, combined with making the homosexual character be the killer, had annoyed me for years. However, I've lately warmed up to the episode, and the fact that Stephanie was the killer. Since I won and read the Quantum Leap comic book Up Against a Stone Wall from the Quantum Leap podcast. It's a sequel to the episode Goodnight Dear Heart, and it's a portrayal of the real Stonewall riots in 1969 similar to the portrayal of the Watts riots in the Quantum Leap episode Black on White on Fire. Sam leaps into Stephanie Haywood on June 22nd, 1969, just as she is being released from prison. The bigoted judge sentenced her to a full 12 years imprisonment for Hiller's accidental death simply because of the nature of their relationship. While in prison, Stephanie had taken some breathtaking photographs of what life was like in prison and her work had caught the eye of publicist Dee Dee Winchester. Sam is immediately taken by Dee Dee to New York for a gallery showing of Stephanie's work. Al tells Sam that Ziggy is spitting out two equally likely outcomes, one being that Stephanie will become famous, the other being that Stephanie will go back to jail. They conclude that Sam must be there to prevent the latter from happening. At the gallery showing, Sam is approached by members of the Daughters of Belitis, the first lesbian organisation in the US, founded in 1955, to join their cause, to which Sam agrees. Sam also meets Clarice, an up-and-coming supermodel who is to do a photo shoot for Sam the next day. After the photo shoot, Sam walks in on Clarice changing and is shocked to find out that she's actually a man. Clarice was born as Clement Phillips, was kicked out of home at 13 for cross-dressing and lived on the streets, doing anything to survive, until he found the underground gay community who helped him to rebuild his life. The next day, Sam asks Al if he could have left there to help Clarice. At that moment, Al finds out that Clarice was in jail, having been heavily beaten by police, then arrested after the gay club he was at was raided. Clarice doesn't want to go to the hospital, and Sam is unable to find a lawyer who's willing to take the case, as there's no physical proof of police wrongdoing. So Sam comes up with an idea to do a photo shoot with Clarice, as is, at the very least to give Clarice a voice and to display what the LGBT community had been facing. Sam, along with Sashi and Ellen from the Daughters of Belitis, try to show the photos to their councilman, but are turned away. Sam gets fired up and his rant is overheard by some men nearby who attempt to assault Sam and Ellen, but Sam is able to fight them off. They decide a revolution is needed, but they're unsure how to proceed. After a few drinks at the Stonewall Inn, 
Owl informs Sam that that night the Stonewall Inn would be raided. Sam pretends that he overheard it from the cops at the police station when he was picking up Clarice. They decide not to go into the Stonewall, but Sam realises that if they stay nearby, they could take photographs of the riots, thus giving the physical proof of the wrongdoing of the police. Al tells Sam that the raid on the Stonewall incited a lot of angry members of the LGBT community to protest against the police harassment and brutality, eventually rioting for two full nights. The Stonewall riots became a turning point in the struggle for gay rights, and even today they're celebrated by gays and lesbians worldwide. The photos of Clarice are still being used in exhibitions and books. He gives up drag in the 70s and becomes a national leader in the movements, pushing for gay rights right up until his death. Stephanie shoots some amazing pictures of the riots, which help put some corrupt cops behind bars and change New York laws. She becomes an even more famous photographer and stays out of jail, and Ellen becomes her girlfriend. They're still together to this day. As Sam asks if things have changed for the better in the future, Sam leaps. I can now accept the events of Goodnight, Dear Heart, when one considers that the events of Up Against a Stone Wall could not have happened if Stephanie had not been arrested and had not had her prison photographs recognised by the art community. It just goes to show you that there is a plan for everyone, and it's good to know that Hiller did not die in vain. I talked to Hayden about this episode because I was conflicted as well. We're kind of on the same track to where it bothered us, but then it didn't bother us. So again, it's a lot of different ways you can view the episode. And what I have to say about the comic book versus the TV show is the comic book definitely takes the stand that Stephanie killed Hilla accidentally and it was a tragic thing that happened. The TV show is more of Stephanie's the killer, the murderer. We got her. So I don't know. I still don't feel really any sympathy for Stephanie because she killed Hilla, but she's a character you follow in the comic book, so. Well, if you were in Stephanie's shoes, you wouldn't be the bad guy in her perspective, right? Right. No one thinks you're the bad guy. But it was cool that there was an actual sequel to this episode, and it's cool that that was the comic book that we gave out. Heather, is there any news? Well, I just have to welcome some new QLP crew members. Yay. Suzanne Smiley and Peter Vuenisek. Welcome to the Quantum Leap Podcast crew. They will be participating in an upcoming segment on the Quantum Leap Podcast, and I'm very excited about it. So uh, welcome aboard, guys. We now have an air date and an episode title. For that NCIS New Orleans with Dean Stockwell, the Quantum Leap Reunion, as it's being called, all over the internets. I even saw a picture. I'm excited. Me too. As previously announced, NCIS New Orleans is staging a Quantum Leap Reunion for its Thanksgiving episode. And TVGuy.com has your first look at Dean Stockwell's guest appearance. Stockwell will reunite with his Quantum Leap co-star, Scott Bakula, to play Tom Hamilton, the father of Councilman Douglas Hamilton, Stephen Weber, on the installment airing Tuesday, November 25th. The episode, Chasing Ghosts, finds the NCIS crew preparing for their annual Thanksgiving dinner while trying to solve a cold case that Dr. Wade, CCH Pounder, has been personally tracking for years. They reopen the case when a Navy-issued stolen gun is linked back to a chief petty officer who died 40 years ago. The Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Almost here. CBS Tuesday. Before TV's number one new show gives thanks. Cheers. They'll do whatever it takes. You find who killed my husband. To heat up a cold case. And the rope Jacob was hung with. What stories will you tell? When the dead have something to say, not even time will shut them off. New NCIS New Orleans. CBS This Tuesday. So that's really soon. Uh, make sure to set your TiVo's DVRs. And what else are there? I don't know. I don't know. I guess you could watch it in real time. <laughs> yeah, you could. Yeah. So do, watch it live. <laughs> do, do that. Anything else? I know we have some exciting interviews to look forward to this season on the Quantum Leap podcast. We do. Uh, maybe tease the listeners with some of the names that are upcoming. Michelle Joyner, who was... Sister Angela in The Right Hand of God. And Diamond Farnsworth, who is... The stuntman for Scott Bakula, the stunt coordinator for Quantum Leap, and Scott Bakula's stuntman in so many 
TV shows and movies, and he also worked on JAG, NCIS, and now he's stunt overseer on NCIS New Orleans. That's awesome. I bet he knows a lot about Scott Bakula. Yes, they're <laughs> they're friends. Weird. <laughs> yeah, they look very similar. They should have used him in the mirror shots. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I got a chance to talk with both of those people, and they're coming up this season on the Quantum Leap podcast. That's awesome. You do have some really awesome interview skills. Thank you. I think I'm starting to get the hang of it, and I'm really appreciative that I get to... Just call these awesome people and talk to them on the phone? Yeah, it's it's amazing. <laughs> They're just like, yeah, call me anytime. We'll, we'll talk. I'm like, okay, you're awesome, and I like you, <laughs> and, and you're cool, and you're on TV. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's not how the interview turns out. No, no. <laughs> luckily, I edited it first. <laughs> Let it, luckily, I edited it before I put it on the air, but it might start out the sound in that way. <laughs> I think any Quantum Leap fan will enjoy these interviews coming up. We talk a lot about Quantum Leap, and there's more to come. But, of course, we can't talk about them until we have them on the SD card. Until they're in hand. In the can. But exciting things happening. I do have some trivia. Ooh, trivia. Do tell. Well, I know that when Sam reads the poem from the Mark Twain book, he says Twain wrote it when his daughter died, but the poem, famous because it was engraved on the daughter's headstone, isn't by Mark Twain but by poet Robert Richardson. Huh. Twain never claimed authorship, so Sam couldn't be reading it with Twain's byline from any of his books. Sam said Mark Twain wrote this when his daughter died. Yeah. He kind of wrote it down, but he didn't write it. Yeah, they got a little bit mixed up on that. Weirdly enough, this is only one of two episodes that feature snow. Huh. Freedom is the other one. So they must have hired a snow crew and they kept him over for this one. Snow is very difficult to keep continuity of. So there's a little bit of there is some snow, then there isn't some snow in that snow scene. I just said snow a lot. In this episode, Sam kind of pretends he knows German. But in all actuality, the locket, which he translates to my love forever, is actually my love for eternity. Similar. I think that's that's close enough. That might be nitpicky. That's I feel like that's nitpicky. But that's not from us. We just got that from the Internet. (laughs) <laughs> they're nitpicky yeah. did you notice that Hilla is breathing when he puts the necklace on her I didn't notice that in first until you told me and then I did notice yeah it's kind of weird when that happens but it's very slight but even enough to go is she okay is she not dead maybe yeah maybe she's she survived the heel attack after all yeah maybe a heel to the head doesn't kill you I don't know <laughs> it might be the whole drowning in water thing because uh, the corpse is from a portrait for Troy and we're breathing too. Weird. Something I wonder if they should fix. No. In the future. You don't think so? No. Yeah. Let it be charming. Yeah. And if they look too dead, I wouldn't want to watch it. It'd be creepy. <laughs> this corpse looks too dead. And I think I already talked about anything else that might be trivia for this episode. I think we've pretty much talked about every single thing we could possibly talk about with this episode. Except the end of the episode where Sam leaps into Charlie Black Magic Walters, a pool player. This is going to be interesting, huh? Do you know a lot about billiards? Nope. Nothing? Never played. Hmm. Huh. Ever. Interesting. So it should be a fun episode for you. I'm going to learn some stuff, I guess, about billiards. <laughs> I know there's some really good music in this episode coming up. That's one of my recollections. At least this was the right leap, right? Yes. Le- it's this right time. leap out. Leap this in. time. I believe. Maybe. I hope. <laughs> Either way, we're going to watch this one. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to go with this one. So. <laughs> Are you excited about the next episode? Sure, why not? Son, do do you know who you are playing? This is Charlie Black Magic Walters, the, the greatest pool player in the world. Eddie, why don't you just beat it? <laughs> Could all the smoke in this joint be clouding your memory? Or have you forgotten? I own the market to this place. That's due in two days. Sam, this is just unbelievable. That's Alberta. Alberta? That's magic stick. It's 21 ounces oh. of pure African ebony inlaid yeah, sure. with mother of pearl. Magic named that stick after his wife, Alberta. It's as big a legend as he is. Went to the Big Easy where he got busted for shooting pool in a whites-only pool hall. And you ended up back in the orphanage. Now look, my eyes may be fine, but I, I couldn't shoot a game of pool with a shotgun. Well, you're going to have to learn. Or else Violet's dream is lost. And Magic won't ever forgive himself for not coming through for his granddaughter. And I'll never forgive myself for not coming through for Magic. It's already wrapped for nine (laughs) balls. 
it's always a rack for nine ball, fool. That's Magic's game. I'm always looking forward to the next episode. I have no idea what's coming, so I have nothing but to look forward to the next episode. I remember liking it. I feel like if you didn't like this series, we probably wouldn't be doing this podcast. That's probably a running thing that I like Quantum Leap. I don't know if people know that about me yet, but I do like Quantum Leap. Do you like Quantum Leap? A little bit. I'm like an excited little teenager going, oh, it's Quantum Leap time. Yay. Until next time, I'm Albie. And I'm Heather. Mark Twain's daughter, Olivia Susan Clemens, died on August 18th, 1896, at the age of 24. She was buried in the Clemens family plot at Woodlawn Cemetery in Elmira, New York. A frequent question that arises is related to the poem that her father had placed upon her headstone. Mark Twain's eulogy to his daughter, Olivia Susan Clemens, March 19th, 1872 to August 18th, 1896. The lines were adapted from a poem entitled Annette, written by Robert Richardson. The poem was published in a book entitled Willow and Waddle, 1893. Warm summer sun, shine kindly here. Warm southern wind, blow softly here. Green sod above, lie light, lie light. Good night, dear heart. Good night. That's what's missing from my life. Someone to love. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Quantum Leap Podcast. Go to quantumleappodcast.com and listen to new episodes. The Quantum Leap Podcast is not affiliated with Belisarius Productions or Universal TV. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get behind-the-scenes information, exclusive content, and to be notified first when new episodes are available. To support the podcast, you can go to patreon.com slash quantumleappodcast. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash quantumleappodcast. The thoughts and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individual and do not necessarily represent or reflect those of the Quantum Leap Podcast, Baron Space Productions, its partners, or affiliates. Quantum Leap Podcast is edited by Albie, John Buchanan, and Juan. Researched by Juan. Contributors Hayden McQueenie and Jill Arroway. Voice talent provided by John Buchanan, Tony Fennerin, and Juan. The co-producer for the Quantum Leap Podcast is Hayden McQueenie, and Juan is the line producer. The Quantum Leap Universe and all it contains is property of Belisarius Productions and Universal TV. No infringement is intended. The Quantum Leap Podcast is a barren space production. <laughs> Do it one more time for safety. All right. Hey, Leapers. This is Hayden. And I need this segment like I need a hole in the head. I said that wrong. Try again. <laughs> well, there's a lot of things to talk about. <clears throat> Well, there's a lot of things to talk about. <laughs> I get it. Too much coffee. <laughs> well, there's a lot of things to talk about. I didn't do it good that time either. <laughs> One more time. In the beginning, when, when, I don't know what the word that is. I all of a sudden have a southern accent. When. <laughs> uh, the, the, record ke- uh, the record player kept fooling me because when you're listening or could, the, because the. We, <laughs> we're almost like a quantum leap think tank. Mm. We're almost like a quantum leap think tank. Think tank. <clears throat> you can do it. We're almost like a. We're almost like a quantum leap think tank. Didn't do it. Think no. tank. Think a tank. Think a tank. Okay. What does this mean? Swiss cheese and color picnic. You wrote that. I did not read. That. I did not. I did not write that. Oh, oh, that was you oh, had wrote to that? wrote it. Oh, I wrote it was. That. It was. Yeah. I, I thought it was literally Swiss cheese. <laughs> so that's what I talked about earlier. I was like, okay. what does this mean?